Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 111, Tabletop Terror, Best Horror-Themed Games. Live from Hamilton, I'm Spooky Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop of Terror himself, Mo T. The Terror Top Bellhop? No, that doesn't really work. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone here on Twitch in the lobby. You can join us Wednesday nights, 9 p.m. New York, Toronto time at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. All right. The chat room says we're on the car- carnage concierge. I kind of oh, like yeah. that one. That one's I, I just deal out and moat out <laughs> carnage as needed. Excuse me. Do you need any carnage? I can help you find that. All right. Tonight we are looking at some terrifying tabletop games. Perfect for playing on Halloween or really any other spooky themed game night. Uh, we're going to start off with a question from a local horror film uh, screenwriter who's looking to know what the best horror board games out there are now that it's 2020. So looking for some newer stuff. We then move on to a couple horror themed reviews, uh, starting off with the alien role playing game starter set from freely publishing, and then moving on to the exit, the game, the catacombs of horror from Thames and cosmos. Then in our week of review, we've got a little bit more horror gaming going on with Nyctophobia, uh, the vampire version. I can never remember. Vampire's Retreat, Vampire something. I always forget. Vampire something version of Nyctophobia. Uh, Chronicles of Crime 1400, which when I got it, thought might be horror, but it ends up at least the first scenario is not. And then Robotech Force of Arms, which is only horrible in the fact that, um, I don't know, I, the, the Robotech people stole a lot of Japanese mechs and got in trouble for it. <laughs> uh, there's not really a Halloween theme there, sorry. Uh, so not all the games we played this week are horror themed, but the rest of the show is our main topic and our reviews are sticking on topic as, as we're trying to do more of as time goes forward. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll uh, share some feedback we received, comments on our content, maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We appreciate your comments and suggestions. If you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Uh, you can also hit us up on social media. I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. And I can be found as Dark Elf LX. First off, a quick comment from Nick Rat about our Alien Starter Set unboxing video. They stopped in to say, looks cool. Thanks, Nick. I got to say, it really does look cool. Uh, to hear more about this one, we'll be deep diving this later in the show when we get to the game room, so you can find out just how cool it is on the inside. Another one, Glenn Robinson left this on our Tales from the Loop starter set unboxing video. Cool. Thanks, Mo. Oh, you're welcome, Glenn. Well, next, Michael uh, Mecha left a comment on our Flick Wars review video posted over on Board Game Geek. I enjoyed everything about the gameplay of Flick Wars. My only issue was that the unit images were cheap and could have been more differentiated. Several looked the same from across the table. Great fun, though, and I don't believe Kickstarter release dates anymore. I Thanks for the comment, Michael. Uh... I don't know. Kickstarter released and Flick Wars wasn't too terrible. I, I've had worse. It, they, they, they have been worse. Um, that's one. When we did the review, we talked about the number of times it was kickstarted, failed, started again, how there was a print and play version and everything. Um, I got to agree with the art on Flick Wars, but you know what? You can just tell that that's an indie Kickstarter game. Like that's a, the designer did the art themselves or like got their brother to do it kind of thing. You can just tell looking at it. There's no artist credited. So I don't know if it is, is uh, actually the designer of the game. At least it doesn't impact the game too much. Like it's not that bad. You're like, wait, what's that red unit over there? Really isn't that hard a question to ask. But I get it. It would definitely be nice. What I think would be way cooler though is that if the different units were actually different size wooden discs. So like the big tanks were actually like a bigger disc, which would for one would be easier to flick or harder. I'm thinking easier, but no matter what, it would be easier to hit because there'd be a larger target out there. I think that would be neater. And then little tiny discs for infantry or something, kind of like what Catacombs did with its different size discs for like the characters and your archers and your spells. Right. And you get uh, uh, some 
fun there because you'd actually, when you change the size, you'd actually be able to change your momentum, yeah. right, with the, with the different masses. Uh, so Aloheart, uh, Aloheart199 on Twitter had a quick comment about last week's podcast episode, always looking for good two-player games. Thanks, Aloheart. And as we noted last week, you aren't the only one. Like, everyone is looking for two-player games. And then seems to have only increased uh, in the time of COVID. But always, again, our most popular question is some variant on tell me about a certain type of two-player game. So hopefully that list helps you out, Aloheart. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares comments and interacts with our content. A few quick announcements before we continue. Just remember to socially distance and be safe this Halloween. Buy a candy catapult. Or a kid catapult. No, that, that, never mind. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I send out an email that recaps all our content we released in the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, and anything else we create. You can sign up by going to tabletopbellhop.com and subscribing right there in the sidebar, or go over to newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com. All right, well, I'm not going to mention it every week, but still, it's only a couple weeks old. I did want to remind everyone that we now have a U.S. merch store where you can buy cool things like Bellhop branded coffee mugs, uh, hoodies, and t-shirts. You can find the shop at merch, M-E-R-C-H dot streamelements dot com slash tabletop bellhop, all one word. And finally, just a remember, reminder, sorry, not a remember, finally, just a reminder that we are getting near the end of the month, and it's going to be time for another AMA live Q&A. From next Wednesday, October 28th, we'll be here live on Twitch at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop, answering questions from our chat room live. And remember, if you can't make it to the live show, though we really wish you could, you can always send questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Social media works too. We're everywhere. It's tabletop bellhop, one word. Now, the best way is for questions to come through the website. That way they don't get missed. They get logged. I get a notification. But I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Tonight, we have a question from local Sebastian Gaspar Woods, who earlier this year won Best Short Script at the Underground Indie Film Festival for his horror romance ghost story, Hold Me Close. Sebastian asks, as of 2020, what do you consider the best horror games? Well, thanks for the well-timed question, Sebastian. I know Sebastian's obviously a big-time horror fan, um, who is a local gamer that I haven't seen since March, unfortunately, someone I do enjoy gaming with often. Uh, he actually won one of our copies of Medium when we were doing the Medium giveaway, too. So horror games is another topic, like last week, that we have covered in the past, but this was way back, episode 14 of the podcast, Back when, you know, Sean didn't even have facial hair. No, he didn't even then. <laughs> we were weeping. No, my facial hair wasn't white, though. That's the problem. That's true. Sean, <laughs> Sean had, had much darker facial was, hair. Yeah. My, my hair was probably about the same. Um, but it was a long time ago. Our um, For one, our quality wasn't as good back then. Second, this is the kind of topic that I think is worth reviving uh, from time to time. Actually, being horror, I should say resurrecting from time to time. And I think this is especially true right now. Because as Sebastian noted, he wants to know, as of 2020, what are the best horror games? Well, a shockingly good number of horror games have come out in like the last three or four years. Games that didn't even exist when we last covered this topic. Now, you'll hear about a number of the games on our list tonight that we couldn't have mentioned before because they didn't exist. There's just It's like the year of good horror games. The last couple of years, 2018, 2019 especially. Well, and it's also worth noting that what is considered horror is also something we could yes. probably debate for years on end. Uh, but we've yeah, covered actually, a bit of a gambit here. so. And that is something that's going to come up when I get to the first game recommendation, because <laughs> there's a big fight over that one. So as usual, no particular order to this list, except for the order of me sitting down with a notepad file going, let me think of what horror games I like, uh, and then putting them down in that order. So maybe that means something. I don't know. If you talk to a psychologist, I'm sure it does. Um, I did try to include a number of different game types and games of various weights. So there should be something on this list for everyone. 
Well, once we get through our main recommendations, we'll have a number of honorable mentions that we will cover briefly and indicate why they didn't make the main list for us. All right, I am going to start off with one that is the most controversial game on this list, and that's going to be for purists who don't think this is based on a horror movie, and that is Jaws. Now, I don't want to get into the whole, is Jaws a horror movie? But what I do want to say is that it doesn't matter because this is an excellent one versus many board game. It's split over two parts where the first part, the players are hunting the shark on the beaches of Amity Island. And then the second part, everything flips around where the hunters become the hunted. This is a great example of just how good licensed games have become. And a great example of tying the theme of the movies to the mechanics. Like this is a, 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 a blockbuster, in my opinion, by Prospero Hall. And even if you don't necessarily call it a horror, it's definitely got that thrill aspect uh, of, of the unknown. And, and that really fits into a lot of what Halloween is. And that was Jaws. Speaking of Prospero Hall, another big hit of theirs from this last year is Horrified. This is the board game featuring the Universal Monsters. It's a cooperative game where players are trying to save their city from one or more of the classic movie monsters. You're going to be facing off against Dracula, Frankenstein's monster, Steenstein, whichever it is, uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon, The Invisible Man, and more. Since it came out, this has become my go-to cooperative game and a great gateway game. This is the game I like to break out at public play events now to hook non-gamers because everyone knows the universal monsters. And then the mechanics of this game is so simple and everyone's on the same playing field because you're playing together. Horrified is a brilliant game. Personally, put away the pandemic, pull out Horrified. Absolutely, could not agree more. And that is Horrified. Now, the next is the most unique game on my list. Uh, this is one I could probably talk about for a whole show because it is so different from pretty much everything else out there on the market, and that is Nyctophobia. Now, this was created by a game designer who grew up playing games with their blind uncle, and they wanted to make a game where the uncle and every other player would be on the same playing field, and they did that by creating a game where all the players are blind. Nyctophobia is a one versus many game where one player plays a hunted trying to catch the hunted who are lost in the woods. The thing here is that only a hunter can see the board. All the other players are wearing blackout glasses and must move around the board using only their sense of touch to feel around and through talking to the other players to try to learn the map of the forest in their heads. This game presents a gaming experience like nothing else I've ever experienced. In, in 40 plus years of playing games. I've never played anything that plays like this. This is a totally unique game that is going to evoke feelings that you just can't get any other way. It's the same way like Dread revolutionized horror role-playing by adding actual tension. Like this, you get jump scares, you get the, the listening and the tension and all of the horror that you can't just get from a standard board game, card game, rolling dice. Yeah, no, I think the not only the concept of the game, which is so unique, but just the fa the way that it, it evol evolved and the way that she that she developed this game or they developed this game uh, is so unique and, and interesting that it would make it an interesting game, even if it wasn't for this whole horror aspect. And that is Nyctophobia. Next, I've got Exit the Haunted Roller Coaster. Now, besides being the perfect gateway to the Exit series, and I still say that, and until they come up with a new one, I think I'll be saying that for some time. If you've never played an Exit game, start with the Haunted Roller Coaster. The theme in this one is perfect for Halloween. It's that perfect mix of spooky and silly, where you have ghosts and zombies and creepy crawlies. It's, it's that all-encompassing Halloween creepiness. There are other Exit with horror themes one we're going to be reviewing later tonight this one is the most accessible of them all and it's the one that i think fits the halloween theme the best yeah no absolutely and i and i, I love the fact that it's it's not a ho true horror as much as it is the family halloween experience right yeah it's got something for everyone in the halloween spirit and not just uh let's see if we can freak people out and that is exit the haunted roller coaster from Tames and cosmos 
All right, this is my strongest recommendation on the list for families. If you have kids and you are looking for something to do on Halloween or around Halloween, or if you're being responsible and staying home and not having to go door to door and possibly spread viruses, I recommend strongly Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion from the Op. Now, I mentioned this in our review last week. We are looking at Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion, not Betrayal at the (laughs) something-something version of Betrayal House in the um that also has mansion in it this is a pizza box style game this is a escape room in a box style game it's a combination of puzzle based escape room and murder mystery tied together using the brilliant coded chronicles system from the bamboozle brothers my family loved this game like my kids yesterday we were playing the exit game and my youngest came up and was like, can we play another mystery game? Can we play another mystery game? Like they were 100% sold on this game. They absolutely loved it. This is some of the best gaming experience we've had together as a family was playing the Scooby-Doo game. Yeah, no, I don't think we can say enough about the coded Chronicles system that they have come up with. And uh, well, we will be saying some more about it, but (laughs) it's uh, it is, it is a system and this is just the first attempt at using it. Uh, And I have to say, they hit it out of the park with Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion. Next, we got the most expensive game on the list. The big fantasy flight, big box, lots of miniatures, tons of tokens, three rule books. Actually, I think it has less than that because it uses an app, but Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition. This is a uh, Mythos-themed game. This is perfect for anyone who's into the whole Cthulhu mythos, elder god type of thing, and for people who like mysteries and puzzles. This is the first game to really highlight what you can do with an app, integrating it with a board game to create a new, better experience. This app allows you to investigate a mansion room by room finding puzzles, doing the puzzles physically on a tablet or on your phone, and trying to find out what's happening. And then once you find out what's happening, figuring out how to stop it or solve it or prevent the murder or everything else. Due to having an app, every game you play is unique and you never know when you start the game exactly what you're dealing with. One game, you'll be battling cultists. The next game, the mansion's on fire. And the last one, you have to find all the pieces of the ritual and cast a spell before the portal in the attic destroys the universe. Plus, when you get expansions for this game, it automatically adds all the expansion content and just mixes it in with everything else. So it just suddenly there's new rooms that can show up or new monsters or new clues. It is an amazing example of what you can do with an app and a board game together. Yeah, no. And if, uh, you know, uh, we have talked about apps and, and games on, on this show before, and we'll leave that for somewhere else. But for this fantastic one that's available and working right now, you can get Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition. Next is Dead Man's Cabal. This one wins the uh, the award of the night for the game with the most unique theme. <laughs> I don't think anything's ever going to top this one for the most unique theme out there, but I, I love it. You play necromancers who have been invited to a party, they, and but you don't have any friends because you're a necromancer, so you need to resurrect some guests to bring with you. I, I like what cooler theme is there for a board game than that. Like, I, I honestly, and like for Halloween game night, especially if you're having a party, if you're having a Halloween party with board games, which right now may not be the most responsible thing to do, but on an average year, if you're having a board game party or game with parties, this is just fits, right? Like you're having the dance party at the party. There are some really interesting mechanics in this game. This is uh, definitely a Euro side of game, a, a, a thinker where you're a lot of planning ahead, a lot of strategy, has some great creepy components. Uh, your main component in the game is different colored skulls and the money you use are bones. Uh, just be sure, fair warning, read the rules for final scoring a couple times and make sure everyone understands them before playing because the final scoring is a bit opaque. Yeah, go ahead and, and check out our reviews on that game. Uh, if, you're, if you pick it up and uh, you'll, you might fe- find some of those things that'll catch you up. And again, that is Dead Man's Cabal. Next, we have Legendary Encounters Alien. 
Now, unlike the Legendary Marvel series of games, the Legendary Encounters series are actually fully cooperative deck builders. The others are this weird mismatch of competitive and cooperative. This is pure co-op. You're going to play through the original series of movies. I think it's the first four. It might be the first three. Sorry, I didn't double check that ahead of time. I know you play for at least the first three. And with each movie being more difficult than the last. What I find most interesting in this game is the way it actually manages to invoke the feelings of tension that you get from the Alien series by having the adversary track with the aliens face down and you never know what it is until it pops up or until you're able to use your scanner and take a peek and you never know if it's just like some little face hugger you don't have to worry about or an alien queen. Like it does a fantastic job of that. Plus it's got the whole you can get impregnated with alien eggs and chest bursters and all the other alien stuff the other thing it did is the encounter series did a great job of making the game more cooperative where you match symbols to be able to give other people abilities and cards and the only way you're going to win this one is to cooperate this does a fantastic job of capturing the feel of the alien universe in a card-based format which is not something i thought i think i would ever hear anyone say so that is Legendary Encounters Alien. One of you, that's, that needs to add to the list of games for you to try when you're down in Windsor. I know yeah, I've still never done any of the Legendary Enc- Encounters. Uh, you know, we made that decision early on. The DC yeah. was the way we were going to go with my uh, for my son. And uh, I've just never ended up touching the Legendary Encounters yet. All right, Tragedy Looper. This is an, an anime-inspired one versus many game that is really unique and a little hard to describe. So I'm going to do the best I can. Um, this this almost is more unique than Dead Man's Cabal, but you can't beat Necromancer Dance Party. Um, one player is like a game master type idea role. Like they're running the game and the other players are moving around on a board and talking to people and it's very anime themed and you go see people and you do nice things to them and they feel happier. And then someone dies and then time resets. And you start playing again and the players have looped back in time and now have to prevent that death from happening. So they got play through it once to kind of see what happened. You're like, Oh, Whoa, the, this, where I don't remember any of the characters names in the game, the, the blonde girl died. So then they play through it again and they try to prevent the blonde girl from dying. And part of that is figuring out how they died, why they died, were they depressed? Did someone murder them? Why did someone murder them? And then they start playing through and they're talking to people and try to and they die again. And then time resets and you keep trying to do that until they eventually solve the puzzle. It is one of the most mechanically unique games I've seen. I will admit though, it is not easy to learn. The tutorial takes a full two to two and a half hour gameplay just to get. And there is a lot for the game master role, which I can't remember what's called to focus on. And it's actually a player versus player. Like the game master is trying to prevent the players from preventing the murder. Like it's, it is a unique game. I'm sorry. I probably didn't do it the best service there trying to describe it, but what a unique experience. So it's mastermind is their term for the, the game master Uh, mastermind versus one to three protagonists. Uh, and you can sort of think of it as a mystery version of Groundhog Day in yeah. anime form. Yeah. Uh, and that is Tragedy Looper. Next is Ghost Stories. This is a Fast and Furious Wuja based cooperative game. Players are playing chi warriors trying to protect their village from an ancient oni, an ancient demon. They do this by battling ghosts, working together, and using the various abilities of the townsfolk to defeat their foes. This is an up to four player game from Antoine Bauza, and it is notorious, well known for its difficulty level. This is one of those games where if you go online and Google it, you are going to find people complaining about how hard Ghost Stories is or bragging about the fact they beat it. And that's the thing with this game is this is so hard to beat, but you always get so close. Like you always feel like there's that chance. And once you just beat it once, it is so rewarding. Like that, just that feeling of we finally did it. We beat Ghost Story. It's probably uneasy. And there are difficulty levels. You ever to get, get good at it. That is combined with a variable board layout. Like the town is a three by three grid and you can rearrange which buildings are where. The enemy monsters spawn through card play. So every game they're going to spawn in a different order in different places. And then the Oni, there's like eight different types of Oni in this game. Shuffle at the beginning, you never know which one you're Throw all that randomness and no game is ever going to be the same in Ghost Stories. Plus, there's a ton of expansions out for this one, which I admit I haven't even tried because the base game is enough for me. 
Yeah, there's actually 11 different expansions out <laughs> right now. Uh, and uh, just a note, it's not actually a horror version, but a m- adventure version, a, a, a fantasy version has been recently re-released. It's uh, called Last Bastion, which okay. is a uh, the re-implementation of ghost stories in a more fantasy save the castle rather than the Wuxia uh, ghost story version. But uh, yeah. we're recommending for Halloween ghost stories. Up next, we've got Sorcerer. This is a two-player dueling card game. By dueling card game, I mean games like Keyforge, Magic, Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, right? To a some of the monsters who fight each other. This features some of the most twisted and dark artwork I've ever seen in a game. Like this is a, a messed up, don't show your kids kind of artwork, you'll give them nightmares card game. The theme is two twisted and corrupted mystical beings are battling over Victorian London. So it's technically, it's a a gaslight, you know, a steampunk kind of feel to it. You're going to send out and equip minions and battle over three fronts. The first player to burn down or destroy two of the three locations in London wins the game. This game features a really unique deck mashing mechanic where you build your character by picking three different things, your character's name, your domain and your lineage. And then you mash those three different decks together to get your deck to play with. So not the full deck construction of Magic the Gathering, but also not like preset decks like Keyforge. This is a really neat game. And this is probably my favorite dueling card game to come out since Magic. No, absolutely. Sorcerer is fantastic. But remember, we did say it's a two-player game. Don't try and play it with any other combination of players. Two-player only. And do be aware, there are a bunch of games out there with the name Sorcerer in the title. You are looking for just Sorcerer, nothing else, released in 2019. Uh, Now, there are additional deck packs and things you can buy for it. But just Sorcerer, not especially, you know, the 1975 Sorcerer, the game of magical conflict. Uh, (laughs) Just Sorcerer. And they just recently kickstarted a new edition, actually, a whole new box set with all new stuff to go with it and yes the box does say i I think it even recommends six players like it's it's no two two player player, two player game player game sorry sorry uh white wizard games it's a two (laughs) player game that was sorcerer just sorcerer no other words just sorcerer from white wizard games that'll help too. look up white wizard games that'll help you find it All right, next, we have another big box Cthulhu game. So I think Cthulhu just has to come in big boxes. You can't get small box Cthulhu games. No, actually, I can think of a couple. There's there's a list for us, the best big box and small box Cthulhu games. But another big one, kind of like Mansions of Madness, this is Cthulhu Death May Die. Instead of Fancy Flight, this one's coming from Cool Mini or Not. Um, If you kickstarted this, you have the largest miniature ever made for a board game, which is the like three and a half foot tall Cthulhu miniature that actually works as the end board of the game. Um, I'm not lucky to do enough to have done that, or I didn't have the money to do that. I don't know if there's luck involved or not. Um, This is a very different take on the Cthulhu mythos. This is a two-fisted dice chucking Cthulhu where you play through set scenarios where your investigators are first trying to make a great old one appear corporeal and then kick its butt. Quite a different feel from most Mythos games where you're trying to, you know, investigate and get all the clues and try to solve it. No, no, no. This is go beat up some cultists to get all the runes. Once you have all the runes, have Cthulhu show up and beat them up. I found that really refreshing. I had a lot of fun with this game. Now, I do admit, I wish this was more of a campaign game. Instead, you're just going to pick an act and you're going to pick an Elder God and put the two together and play. I would have liked some character progression, but overall, still a great, fun game with some fantastic miniatures. Yeah. And on, on, the, on the opposite side of, of Mo, who wishes that it was campaign, the benefit of the way it is, is that it's got this great mix and match where you can pull it out any time and say, hey, let's do act three with this Elder God tonight. Cool. Let's all play. Yeah. And you can. Uh, and so if, you know, Joe's down and he's never seen act six yet, great. You can jump in and do act six with whichever demon you want. And so that is Cthulhu death may die a very different take on Cthulhu games. 
All right, my final two recommendations tonight. We're going to aim for the younger audience. For those of you out there who have kids and children and want to play with, Scooby-Doo should be down here with these two, actually. Scooby-Doo belongs on this list. Though Scooby-Doo, I suggest playing it once you have kids that are definitely at reading age because it's more fun if they can read the books with you. Here's one that it actually can work as young as preschoolers, and that is Shaky Manor. This is a unique game from Blue Orange Games that features a bunch of different like cardboard boxes without a lid. I don't know how to describe it. It's a segmented cardboard tray that's divided into eight different rooms. And each different room is a room in a, in a haunted manner. And in the rooms, you put in a bunch of components and the components in this are really cute. There's like an eyeball that rolls around. There's a witch meeple, it's a plastic spider. There's all these like cute little board game components. You put them in and everyone's got the same matching stuff in their, their little mansion. And then you flip up a card and it's going to show a room with a set number of things in it. And everyone has to shake their manner to try to get their room to just have that stuff in it. It is really way more fun than that sounds like it is like as an adult i love this game this is way too much fun just trying to shake the stupid box around and of course because everything's made of different materials like of course the eyeball rolls everywhere the meeple's hard to slide the snake's even harder because has more surface area right like there's 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 more to it with the physics here but it's something even little kids can play with plus talk about toy horrific like this is one except for the fact you're probably going to lose some pieces the kids are going to love playing with even when you're not there yeah, I don't know. This is one of those ones that made me put it in that little, I don't know if it's Halloween horror concept at the top. I, I, they've got some, some Halloween theming in there, but it's, it's a little on the edge. <laughs> I don't know. You got witches and eyeballs and that spider. To me, that's Halloween stuff. But that is Shaky Manor. All right, last one on the list. I'm going to finish this off with my favorite kids game that's ever been produced to date this one's great for older kids and to be honest i break this out if we were having a horror game night with all adults here i would still be breaking this out that is ghost fighting treasure hunters this is a cooperative game for four players where you play kids rushing into a haunted house in order to find and escape with eight gems you need to do this before the ghosts turn into haunts and overrun the house Players are going to have to work together, figuring out which gems to grab first, and balance grabbing gems with fighting back the encroaching ghosts. I have yet to find someone who did not enjoy this game, whether child, adult, everyone has fun with this game. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's just a fun game, and I, when it's out at the parties, adults go over to play it. Like, it's yeah. not one of those games where it's like, oh, I should go play with the kids. No, no, I want to go play Ghost Fighting Tiger Hunters. If there's a kid there, fine, whatever. I want to play Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters. It's a great game. First time we played this was at a New Year's party because we had given it to uh, Big G for Christmas, I think it was. And she broke it out and we were all playing it. It was a way for her to take part on New Year's. And then when she went to bed, the game stayed out and kept being played till three in the morning. That was about five hours after my daughter went to bed. People were still playing Ghostbusters, Ghostbuster, sorry, Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters. And it is worth noting, people have, uh, are talking about in the chat here, is there is a Ghostbusters Protect the Barrier variant of that. That. it is significantly cheaper does have a cooler theme note it is the female ghostbusters the new ones not the old ones but the production quality is poor to be polite it is a smaller board the cards are paper thin the miniatures are not well done i have heard i haven't tried this myself i've heard from many people just get the full version like if you want go get some ghostbuster action figures or something to replace your kids but the ghostbuster version is not worth picking up well, and that is Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters. All right, up next, we have some honorable mentions. Um, I'm not going to get into as much detail about each of these, except to make note mainly why they didn't make the list. So uh, number one, um, there's a big discussion going on about this one on Facebook right now because of a picture I shared today, and that is Zombicide. The Zombicide series of games are hugely popular, cool mini or not, I would go so far as say overproduced miniature filled games. These are the games where they come with like 126 figures and you get Stephen Hawking's miniature. And like, it, it's just crazy the amount of minis and characters and expansions for these games. There are a lot of people out there that love these series. Um, I've tried a couple of them. I played Invader and Black Plague and I found them to be fun, but repetitive. They weren't great. Uh, it's the same problem I found with Cthulhu Death May Die. There is no campaign play. It's sit down, and play the adventure and you go to the next part and you start over again and you 
even like the first mission of invaders you find the super weapon but then you don't have it in mission two that just bothered me um it's definitely a neat co-op kind of puzzle game but not for me there are people out there that love them so i did want to throw it on here for fans of the series there are a lot of people who like zombicide yeah they are in in fact uh simon was joking that uh the other day someone had asked about uh some some halloween games and uh simon had zombicide on their list twice um uh, because it was that good <laughs> Um, go. and I want, I'm going to actually slip one in here as well. And I, this is going to be an honorable mention because I know you don't have it. So you haven't played it yet, yep. but the Halloween expansion for King of Tokyo would be right up your girl's oh. alley. Yeah. I just, I, we don't play King of Tokyo that often. That's the problem. We don't, that, that's a, we have to have more people. I don't like King of Tokyo four or three player. It's right. okay. To me, you need like the five or six, you need right. a big group. And we just don't get a big group often enough. But yeah, it is a cool expansion. And if you want to talk about cool, low-cost expansions that are just neat for Halloween, the Pumpkin Trains for Ticket to Ride. That is one of the neatest, cute expansions. All it is is replacement trains. And actually it has for Ticket to Ride Europe, it also has the stations for it. You get little pumpkin trains and little stations that you can replace your playing pieces for, for Ticket to Ride. So there, there's another, that's a neat, quick pickup to turn one of your existing games into a Halloween game. There we go. And so that was uh, King of Tokyo, the Halloween expansion, and uh, the pumpkin expansion for Ticket to Ride. Which I, I'm sure has a specific name. We actually, I think we might we might be able to give away a copy of the pumpkin expansion. <laughs> Maybe that's what we give away next week. We were Maybe. talking about giving away a game during our Halloween AMA. Maybe we'll give away the pumpkin expansion if we have some left. So next, I have, I would grab it, it's almost in reach. Uh, we were talking about the Coded Chronicles games earlier tonight. I have the next game in that series uh, sitting here from the op. This isn't published yet. I'm getting to get an early look at it. And that is The Shining Escape from the Overlook Hotel. Now, I don't know what it is with Coded Chronicles coming out with the same name as other games because there's already a The Shining board game from Prospero Hall. This is not that. This is The Shining Escape from the Overlook Hotel. The escape, I think, is going to be the key word here. This is the second Coded Chronicles game that started with Scooby-Doo. Um, based on how much we love Scooby-Doo, I expect to dig The Shining. The only reason it's not on the list is we haven't actually had a chance to sit down and play it, but I think it'll be on there. No, this one's not going to be family friendly. This will be just probably Deanna and I playing through this one. Yeah, no. And I, I actually had difficulty finding it on Board Game Geek, uh, probably in part because there isn't a lot of traffic to it yet. But if you just type in The Shining, this one doesn't actually always show up. Um, oh, that's, so maybe uh, it's still in pre-release. And, and it, it's on Board Game Geek. I did find it. I did get. I did get the box art I needed. But uh, until I typed in Escape or, or really looked around, mm. it was hard to find. Um, unlike the Scooby Doo one, whereas if you type in Scooby Doo, the Escape yeah, one is up. the first one that shows up on my list. So that is yeah, it might be a little hard to find. Yeah, that is The Shining Escape from the Overlook Hotel. All right, next is Arkham Horror, the card game. This one I am tossing on the list because everyone else seems to love it. As usual, while doing these lists, I always take a bit of time to do some research. Usually I make my list and then I go look around and see if there's anything I missed. And I got to admit, Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters was one of those. I saw that and I was like, oh, there's a dull moment. Like, how did I miss that? It's my favorite kids game. One of the games that is on like every list, every list of top horror games has Arkham Horror, the card game. Now, this is a cooperative living card game from Fantasy Flight Games. I haven't played it myself, so I couldn't tell you, but everyone else seems to love it. I tend to stay away from the living card games. Just too much money having to buy expansions that just keep coming out. And that is Arkham Horror, the card game. Finally, we have Warhammer Chaos in the Old World. This is one I do have, and I love. This is a great game. This is a super asymmetric game. One of the first games that really pushed asymmetry to the limit, where every player plays one of the different gods of chaos who are doing horrible things to the Warhammer world. What's brilliant here is the goal, the end game goal, what you are getting victory points for is completely different depending on which of the four chaos gods you play. Corn, of course, you get God, uh, things for killing people and Zinch is for getting spells out and corrupting people and Slanesh is getting more people on the board. It's fantastic. The reason this one's not on the list is there's no one out there that's going to be able to find a copy of this for any price, any sane person to be willing to play. Fantasy Flight lost the Warhammer license, boy, like five, six years ago at this point. So good luck trying to find a copy of this one. But it's going to be on here just because it's such a great game. So if you have a copy, break it out for Halloween. 
$180 US on uh, eBay. Is that used or new? Uh, that's opened. Yeah, I so. was gonna say that's, that's <laughs> low for you. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's a it's a pricey one, and that is Warhammer Chaos in the Old World. Well, that's it for our Halloween horror filled game recommendations. We're gonna head over to the lobby and see if anyone in our chat room has anything spooky to add to our list. All right, so we've got uh, Ryan's asking Cthulhu Wars. Is this is that the same rule set? It's supposedly similar, but not the same. I don't. I know it was based on Chaos in the Old World, but it was not. Like, it's not the same designer. Eric Lang's the one that did Chaos in the Old World, where Peterson Games did Cthulhu Wars. Right. And I, I highly doubt they just copied Eric's game. I, I would have heard that if it happened. But it does have the you each play a different Elder God, and you're trying to control territories on a map. So there's some overlap, but it isn't just like the same rules overlaid. As far mm-hmm. as I understand, right? Cthulhu's just not as cool as Warhammer, though. Either way, so. And it's That's called a personal opinion. the uh, the Ticket to Ride expansion is Ticket to Ride Halloween Freighter. It was a limited edition 2012 release, and oh. Board Game Geek listings currently have it as a hundred euros to uh, get. Maybe we, we should sell copies <laughs> we have left then, because we do have some. As so far as I know, we, we we had a pile of them. They were we've been using those as extra life giveaways for years now, and people like last year were like, "Yeah, hey, yeah, I've seen these before." So I know Jeff Seuss, I don't know if he's still in the chat room, had posted a couple things on our Discord, some recommendations. I don't know if you want to grab that or if Jeff's yeah, here. Yeah, let me just, uh, well, Jeff's, um, having, Jeff's having some trouble tonight getting into our, uh, getting, getting, getting our stream. So I'm going to oh, hop in here. Uh, Dread, of course, is fantastic and still in print for RPGs. Yeah, so this is one thing I did not cover RPGs tonight. Uh, that that is a caveat we probably should have said that at the beginning because we did call it tabletop terror but i am reviewing an rpg later so that's part of why i kept that there i i don't know any modern horror rpgs except well alien which i'll be reviewing later but like i haven't kept right and jeff jeff's mention for that would be the hot horror story game would be 10 candles see i know Uh, of that game you play it like you light 10 candles at the start of the game and when the 10th candle goes out and eclipse then, phase is considered horror? That's Ryan's claiming eclipse phase is considered horror. I don't think transhumanism is horror to me. Personally, yeah, I think yeah. eclipse phase is a fantastic next step from Cyberpunk 2020. Right. It's taking things to that next level and adding a more sci-fi element to it. And, and for those tells me that's transhumanism. For those fans of the game, Call of Cthulhu is in its seventh edition. Seventh, uh, wow. <laughs> uh, and uh, according to Jeff, I will quote him here because I won't, I won't admit this. GURPS Horror is still the best how to run a horror game book out there. You know what? I've heard that. It's written by Ken Height. So that would make sense. Ken Height is a brilliant horror author uh, who has written a ton of stuff for Pelgrim Press, Knights Black Agents, and Dracula Dossier, and lots of Cthulhu stuff. I can totally see that. Right. Uh, what else have we got here? Um, apparently, there's some great. Uh, uh, DCC horror uh, out there that can be found. Did we get any board game recommendations? I think we did. Uh, Letters uh, from Whitechapel, if I remember. Yeah, I'm just trying to sort of scroll through. Uh, which is a game I've never played. That's a that's a Jack the Ripper, which I guess fits. Uh, Mansions games. of Madness. Yep. Eldritch Horror. Eldritch Horror is, is, is the Cthulhu games I don't like. I don't know. Right. I'm not a huge fan of uh, Eldritch Horror or Arkham Horror, the original games myself. I do hear Eldritch Horror plays quicker. The the move around the map a lot, trying to find the right things. I don't know. I found the game very random myself, but there are definitely a lot of fans out there. Mountain Pop is mentioning Dead of Winter. Yeah, that's that will never be on my list because I played three times and never once got to interact with a crossroad card. And the entire point of the game was supposed to be this really cool crossroad card system. And the fact I could play three times and not get to see the thing that's supposed to be cool about the game, I had no interest in playing the game after that. Now, again, lots of fans, lots of people. I, From what I understand, I'm the exception that it's just rare that that would happen. But there's a part in that game where wherever you go to do something, the player to your left draws a card. And if you do the thing that's on that card or your name's on the card, a cool thing happens to you on your travels. And that never happened in three games. That never happened to me once. 
And I'm like, well, the whole thing's supposed to be this cool crossroads card thing, and I didn't even get to see it. And to me, that I just that's a game I honestly think is broken. Right now, I know there's an expansion, maybe that fixes it. Plus, it's also a social deduction game, and I think most fans of the show know I'm not a fan of social deduction in the first place. So, a social deduction game where I didn't get to see the cool part wasn't for me. But we will definitely toss that on the list. Um, they probably won't end up in the blog post, but we'll definitely throw them in the show notes. Uh, and then also, so we've got uh, Betrayal at Mystery Mansion. The Scooby Doo one. Uh, oh, and, see, I want to try that. I haven't. I, I have no clue. And Fury of Dracula was Jeff's last uh, suggestion. All right, Fury of Dracula. I own the original from Games Workshop, published in 1986 or so. That is really unique game, um, where it's a one of those hidden role kind of like um, Toronto Scotland Yard. So Dracula is like moving around the board. You can't see him and the other people are trying to hunt him down and he can send like minions to attack and that it is really neat looking game that they have now put out like five different editions and I never played it. Like I owned it and I never played it. I just, I don't know. I think you needed exactly four players, the original, and that was hard to find. Right. Uh, Ryan's calling out a touch of evil. Um, all of the games from that series, I have not played any of them the twilight creations i think is the company that does touch of evil uh, i have not tried it or is that the evil hat one uh flying frog productions yeah flying frog okay it's a company that uses actors for all their artwork and it just to me looks really silly i know some people dig it but like it's like people in cosplay for all their artwork mm-hmm. and i i don't know i haven't tried any of them i've heard good things so i'm fortunately that couldn't be on my list so i haven't tried it yeah no it's 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 a choice, you know. They they they're doing their own photography, yes. obviously, and and yep. and it's a it's a choice. It's a but, dedicated choice, and they stuck yep. with it for all their games. Yep. Um, but I, I think that I guess. Yeah. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Um, it gives it a certain feel. There's no doubt, doubt about that. Oh, I guess one of their games, Conquest of Planet Earth, is all art. Oh, okay. Okay. All the ones I had seen <laughs> have been like cosplayers. And there are a lot of um, touch of a touch of evil, like. Yes. Yeah, like, uh, what is the expansion list? 11 expansions for A Touch of Evil. Um, although some of that apparently, is, yeah, some of that is soundtrack, so it's not actually... Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a problem with Board Game Geek, because you get, like, all the promos and stuff like that. Yeah, it's... No, they're definitely popular. I watched one of them get played on um, Will Wheaton's Tabletop, and it didn't look like my kind of game. Right. There were games I wouldn't put on the list, specifically. Oh, and there was well, a 10-year example... anniversary edition of Touch of Evil, actually, yeah, that came out this year. Uh, so. We owned one of their games that actually had a wind-up zombie. You, like, put stuff out, and you wind up the zombie, and if it walked into your character, it was kind of silly. We had some older ones on the list, too, that I don't have anymore, like Spooks and Brains. Just games have evolved. Like, they were neat, cute games. One was a trick-taking game where you collect brains. Yeah, Fountain the, uh... Papa agrees with the Crossroads thing being kind of broken in Dead of Winter, but still enjoyed the rest of the game. The reviews for the Touch of Evil 10-year anniversary are very much people who enjoy the franchise. I'll just yeah. put it that way. That doesn't surprise <laughs> me. All, All right. right. I think we got enough to go on. I think we can uh, move on because mainly I kind of need. Yep. Stuff. Same here. Finally, if you've got a game night question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email me directly. Questions at tabletopbellhop.com. <clears throat> Let's take a deep dive into the alien role playing game starter set recently published by Free League Publishing. Before we start, I do need to mention that Free League was awesome enough to send us a review copy of this RPG beginner box. Please also note that this is a read review. We have not had a chance to actually get this game to the table and play through the included adventure. All right, the Alien, the role-playing game starter set was created by Thomas Herenston and novelist Andrew E.C. Gaska, with art and graphic design by Marin Grip and Kristen Garnat. The starter set was published by Free League Publishing, otherwise known as Freya Ligon, uh, in 2020. The Alien RPG uses the D6-based Year Zero engine, which was originally announced in or introduced in the game Mute Year Zero. Now, to set the tone here, this is the elevator pitch for the Alien RPG. A universe of body horror and corporate brinksmanship where synthetic people play God while space truckers and marines play host to newborn ghoulish creatures. It's a harsh and unforgiving universe and you are nothing 
if not expendable. If you want to take some time to see what you get in this RPG box set, be sure to check out our unboxing video on YouTube. All right, so this is to start, like, cover some of the components. This is a heavy box set. So a few weeks back, I think it's about three weeks ago now, but a couple podcasts back, I did a uh, review of free sales from the loop starter. This box, a little sparse from what I liked from the starter side. It's good. It's a solid box, but it just didn't seem to have a lot in it. Whereas this box, this alien box is not short at all on content. The other thing I loved is the fact the box is a nice, solid board game quality box. I love that because I have so many older RPG starter sets on my shelves that are just crushed and smushed and falling apart once you take the stuff out. So big thumbs up for the box quality of all things. Now, due to the amount of stuff in this box, I think what we're going to do tonight, instead of going through everything you get and then my thoughts and how to play and all that, is what I'm going to do is go through each of the things you get in the box one at a time and share some of my thoughts on each component as we get to it. Well, it's not something you can gloss over quickly, like in some starter box sets. So first off, I'm going to start with uh, the dice. You get two sets of custom D6 dice. These are engraved. Uh, one are base dice. These are your basic dice are 10 and one set of 10 stress dice, so 20 dice total. The base dice are black with white numbers and have a prominent burst symbol on the six side. The stress dice are yellow with black numbers, also have the burst side on the six, but an alien face hugger on the one. We'll talk about why in a little bit. These are nice dice. Like some of the, what I love with the numbers are bigger than your standard D6. And there's like a red border, like not a red, sorry, a, a square border on the outside. They're just really easy to read, which I really like. And especially the way they called out the numbers that are important to the system, which is the ones and sixes. Yes, you could play the game and just look for your standard sixes as successes and the standard ones on your panic dice. But this is just so much cooler. And dice aren't exactly cheap, so getting 20 nicely made custom dice isn't something you can dismiss easily. Yeah, one of our one of the fans of the show, Jeff Seuss, was pointing out, and I, don't, I didn't look up the numbers, but the price on the dice is kind of crazy. Like, it may be worth picking up this set just for the dice. Plus, there's a whole bunch more. Like five pre-generated characters, um, each character sheet's two-sided, a headshot of the character with some background information and in-game statistics. Um, and the rules for their unique um, talent. Each character's unique talent is on one side. Then the other side's a more traditional character sheet with all kinds of places for tracking all your in-game information. These sheets have most of the information pre-filled out. So you're looking at it and, you know, it's got your name and all that. And it's got all your number, your, your abilities and your stats filled out. And you're expected to use them during play. But I'm not sure if I'd want to do these this with these sheets like these are that super thin glossy paper like magazine paper and like it's that glossy stuff that i haven't tested it but most pens and paper pencils don't really want to write on this it's the kind of thing you usually need a marker for now you can find blank character sheets on free league's website i went hunting but i don't see these pre-filled out ones so you basically have to take out download the free blank ones and then copy over the information which is an odd choice yeah, and this for me is annoying. Either give me a sheet I can use and actually use or something I can print out easily and just use. A character sheet I can't write on is pointless. Yeah, it's a, it's a really odd choice. Like they definitely went for the look, the glossy old look how pretty it is as, as opposed to function. I get you could probably grab a Sharpie and write these on there, but like I, you're going to take health and heal. Like there's things that are, I don't know, really, really odd choice in my opinion. Next, we have a few decks of cards. Uh, we mentioned this when we were talking about uh, a couple previous reviews, like the Shadow Run box set. I love cards in my RPG starter sets. Please give me things that save me from having to look up stuff in the rule book. Now, one of the decks features artwork showing a headshot of all the characters and NPCs in the game with summarized game statistics on the back. Then there's a deck of gear cards. Interestingly, these are just the weapons, which, yeah, it's alien, kind of makes sense. They feature a feature a picture of the weapon on the front and the game mechanics on the back it did seem odd to me though like there's no armor or any of the other types of gear or the ai or like there's a significant gear check section of the rule book but all they give you is the weapons i guess that's what they expect you to use the most often 
Finally, there is a set of initiative cards numbered one through 10. We'll get into how those work later. And the cards themselves, the quality is decent, but not great. Um, they're a bit thinner than I'd like, but they do have a really nice linen finish and they're very matte. So you don't get any reflection off them, which is a nice touch. Right. Well, and the thinness is only really a problem if they need to be shuffled. If they're just a reference card and not randomization, then it's not as big of a problem. Now, the initiative cards are going to get shuffled at the start of every fight. So those ones do get shuffled, but the rest are definitely just for reference. Now, the next thing in here is one of the largest and nicest RPG maps I have ever seen. This thing is massive. Now, I didn't convert this to feet. I did find the stats online saying it is 864 by 558 millimeters. So I, I don't know. Is that is that eight meters by five meters? No, no, it no. wouldn't be meters. <laughs> eight feet? Eight, I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> It's not quite reaching a meter, but it's big. And it is made of some nice thick paper, like the opposite of the stuff in the rest of the box, like some really nice stuff. And again, that matte finish. And having a game room with pot lights, you have no idea how much I appreciate that matte finish. One side features the stars of the middle heavens showing off a huge star map with hundreds of systems on it. And it's color coded for different factions from the alien universe showing what con who controls each system. And then the systems are divided into rings that radiate out from the core system all the way to the outer rim territories and beyond. I honestly had no idea there was this much background for alien in the movies. Like, I, I don't know if this map is somewhere in a, a screenplay. I have no idea where it came from, but I, it's a really cool sci-fi map. On the other side, you have a number of Starship deck plans. Now, these are specifically tied to the included cinematic adventure that's in this box set. This is meant to be used using the included counters, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, these are sweet ship maps. Like, these are the kind of maps that I would totally steal and use in any other RPG. Next time we're playing Star Wars, I may be throwing an alien map in there. I have to say, watching Mo try to show off the map in the unboxing is honestly one of the main reasons you should go check it out on YouTube if you haven't yet. I actually felt bad that I had to cut out some of his desperate attempts to make it fit on camera. Yeah, I had to go halfway across the room to be able to hold <laughs> it out wide enough that the camera could actually pick up this thing. This thing's huge. It's massive. Now, I mentioned counters. There is a single counter sheet here, a die-cut counter sheet. There's uh, counters for different characters, NPCs, ships, and, of course, aliens in all kinds of shapes and sizes. I, interestingly, each of these is two-sided with the non-icon side showing like a radar blip, which I thought was really cool. And I couldn't help but think Space Hulk as soon as I saw that. I'm like, oh, Gene Stealer blips. Uh, there are also a bunch of text counters. These seem to be some kind of order tokens for ship-to-ship -to -ship combat. So they say stuff like go dark, ram, maneuver, and fire weapon. I say they look like that because these actually aren't mentioned anywhere in the rulebook. Yeah, it, it's odd that they'd include manufactured punchable items that aren't used. Now, what I did see is sold separately is a counter and map set. And I think what we have here is they put both of those in the starter box. And that's something you would normally buy for the core game. So I have to assume that the ship combat rules are in the full core game. Next, we get to the meat. So here, this is going to take a bit to go through. We are going to talk about the actual rule book. So this is important because this game comes with an impressive rule book. This is over a hundred pages. This is not a quick start guide. This is not simplified rules from the full role-playing game. This is a full role-playing system. See, Alien is designed to be played two ways, something I didn't realize before reading this box. The first way is cinematic play. This is where players are going to play pre-generated characters through a single story, possibly even in a single session. You're going to play through one or two sessions, maybe five hours max. These are high tension games with a lot of character interactions and interpersonal relationships and characters working at odds to accomplish personal agendas that are going to go against the goals of the group. We're looking at high adventure and high lethality, exactly what you'd expect from something based on the Alien movies. Now, the second method of play is campaign play. This is where players are expected to play the same characters that they generated themselves over a long-term campaign. For that to work, lethality is much lower. Characters are actually expected to grow and change over time and, well, be a more traditional role-playing party and work together. The stakes are lower and intergroup conflict isn't as expected, though not unheard of. Now, what this box set does is it gives you half. It gives you everything you need to play in a cinematic campaign to be able to play a, sorry, a cinematic play. 
versus campaign play. Campaign play isn't covered at all. Like you don't have any rules for making characters here. You don't have any rules for exploring space. You don't have any rules for colonizing. You don't have any rules for ship combat. You need the full Alien the Role-Playing Game Core rulebook for that. But you have everything you need to play cinematic adventures, which includes the one that's in the box and any future adventures they publish that are called cinematic adventures, of which there is one already out, which I happen to have right over here, called Destroyer of Worlds. So to be able to play their first published module, you don't need the core rulebook. You just need the starter set, which I thought was a really unique way to market a game. Absolutely. And that may explain the unused chip combat tokens yeah. as they likely have another cinematic adventure planned that makes use of those. And the rules would be, would be included then in that uh, adventure for whatever you use them yep. for. Now let's dive into this rule book a bit more. Now for the podcast, I am just going to give you a broad overview over this. Now, if you go over to the blog where I've written up the full review here, I go into it chapter by chapter, breaking down all five of the chapters, what you're going to find in each chapter. No, I don't explain the rules or anything, but I deep dive it a lot more than we're going to do here. Otherwise we'd be here all night. And as always, you can find that at tabletopbellhop.com under reviews. So the book starts off with a chapter called Space is Hell, which I thought was aptly named because this introduces you to the alien universe and sets the tone for the game. Now the tone, the, the, the tone here is body horror, the unknown, hubris, corporate greed, personal agendas, and not knowing what lies around a corner, the corner. You get a timeline and background info on the movers and shakers and what likes is like on the frontier of space. Now, the key themes of this game, and this is something I like about Free League, is they put their key themes right up front at the front of all their books to say, hey, this is what this game is meant to explore, and that is space horror, sci-fi action, and a sense of wonder. Now, I have to wonder if there are may actually be folks out there listening to this who haven't seen any of the Alien movies. Now, if so, this might be a little more abstract, but I really don't think this is the place to break down the space horror genre of these, that these movies essentially defined. So head out there, and if you are interested in the theme, go check out Aliens, <laughs> Alien, one of those two, and then, you know, then you can figure out if you want to see any more. Well, for, for you want the horror, you watch Alien. If you want the space marine shooting aliens, you want Aliens. Those, right. are, those are the two core, and then there's quite a few more. Then there's others. <laughs> yep. Then then there's Prometheus. No. Which no, we won't no, even talk about. That's kind of like Highlander 2. Um, I, uh, to be honest, here we go. I've seen this. So unlike our reviews of Jaws or Horrified, <laughs> no, no. I've seen all the Alien movies. I'm a big fan. All right. So next, um, the book dives into characters and stats. This is pretty much traditional. You have four attributes and a number of skills based on the attributes. Uh, important things here, though, are personal agendas. These are a way to earn what are called story points. If a player is able to act to advance their character's personal agenda during an act of play, despite personal risk or sacrifice, they're awarded a story point. These can be used at any point in the future to automatically succeed in any role. So they're huge. So this is really pushing the players, holding out the carrot to play up those agendas. Again, this is in the cinematic play where those agendas are probably going to be at cross, counter cross to other players. Uh, interpersonal relationships are also another big part of the game where every character is going to have one buddy and one rival. And this sets up a nice web between the party of people you like and people you rival with. Um, the ties to the group, it ties the characters together. And again, for the preset characters for the cinematic adventure, this is all done for you. So you already have these relationships built before you start playing. Right. Nothing really unexpected there, especially for cinematic where that inner party play is expected to be there and add some drama. And really the story points, I think most people would be familiar with as fate points or, mm -hmm. you know, those, that sort of a concept in an RPG. Yeah, yeah, just another in-game economy and in-game resource. Now, one thing that is specific to the alien setting is a focus on four consumables. You have air, water, food, and power. These are huge when you're talking about a game out in space, especially in a horror game. This is all about survival and resource management and allocation of resources is a big part of the game. This is one of the few modern RPGs that has encumbrance rules, and I think they fit. Absolutely. It is hard to develop a real horror experience without enough tension and scarcity 
builds tension. If you're worried about where your next drink of water, your next breath of air, or your next bullet for the alien that's around the corner is going to come from, that ranks up, ramps up the tension. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not until actually chapter three of a five-chapter book that we actually dive into the mechanics of the game. Uh, the system here is the basic Year Zero engine. You're going to build a pool of six-sided dice. The pool is going to be based on your character's skill, which is tied to an attribute. You're going to add those together, and you're going to modify it based on gear and environmental conditions. For most roles, all you want is a single six on any of those D6s. Additional sixes can be spent for additional effect. This is something you're going to recognize from Tales from the Loop, Mutant Year Zero, and pretty much every game that Free League publishes. Now, these effects that you get with the extra dice are actually determined by the skill being used. So, uh, if you've listened to our Tales from the Loop review, you'll already be pretty familiar with this yeah. dice pool system they're using. It is, it is a really simple, quick system. That's what I do like about it. Now, the new thing they've added to Alien is stress. Managing your character's stress is a huge part of this game. Characters start off with zero stress, but will gain more as the story unfolds. It's pretty much inevitable. Now, one way you're going to get stress is if you fail a roll, you can push. Now, in Tales of Loop, you did that and took a condition. Well, in this game, when you push, you're going to gain a stress. What pushing does is let you re-roll your dice roll. So if you didn't get a six on that big pool of dice, you can push it. Now, narratively, the player does have to justify this. What did your character do to push themselves? What is, what's the thing that made them go a step further? What made them step out of their comfort zone, etc.? Now, there are also a lot of other ways to get stress. Again, I'm not going to dive into the details here, but it's things like being under pressure, witnessing someone panic, seeing something horrible, which is going to happen a lot in this game, running out of ammo, experiencing something alien for the first time, and so on. Right. So this might seem similar to the conditions, you know, to conditions in Tales from a Loop, but there's really much more to it. Uh, and it, it's a much more sliding scale as opposed yeah. to, I think there were only four or five different conditions yeah, in Tales from the Loop that, that you could step through that were more of injury, more of, uh, in, mm -hmm. in, in Tales from the Loop, they're more of an injury status, whereas this is actually more affecting the, uh, the system. Yeah, and actually the conditions still exist. I don't mention them here in the, during the review at all, but you still have that condition system that did exist in Tales from Loop, which is separate. Like when you run out of air and you run out of food, you can be hungry and exhausted. So those, those still exist. So stress is something on top of that. So it's another layer on top of the conditions. Now, what stress does that's positive for the players is you get more dice in your pool. So for every stress you have, you get another dice because stress can help you focus and the adrenaline can make you faster and it can give you the tunnel vision you need to be able to get something done. The downside is that every stress die, which I mentioned when we talked about the dice, the yellow ones have a panic symbol on it, which is the face hugger, the typical alien face hugger on the one. If a one's rolled, your character panics in addition to doing their action. Now, when this happens, you're going to roll on a panic table, see how you react. These are all pretty much horrible. And many of these reactions are going to be stress-inducing for those around you. And then once their stress goes up, there's a good chance they're going to panic. And you can get a pretty big cascading effect. I got to say, I think that's pretty fitting for the alien setting. And also not unfamiliar to people who play games like Space Hulk or specifically XCOM, where you have really got that stress and panic and panic causing panic. Uh, sort of chain of events that can occur. Now, thankfully, there are a few ways characters can relieve stress, uh, one of which is tied to every character as a personal item. So once per act, you can actually sit there and describe what you've done with this thing. It's something that's important to you alone and no one else. This is something, again, fits really well for the movies, you know, the picture of the family, the the, the rosary or whatever, the, 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 the one object that ties you back to why you're out in space doing what you do. Um, that I, I think fits really well to the setting. Plus there's also rules for medical care, drugs, alcohol, and other ways to reduce stress. And I am not going to make any jokes here. So moving on. Also fitting to the system is a rather detailed combat section, something you won't find in the Tales from the Loop game. Uh, the Alien RPG uses three different time units. We're looking at rounds, turns, and shifts. Rounds last seconds are mostly used during combat. Turns are used during stealth mode, which I'll mention in a minute. And last are shifts, where you actually have duty shifts, where you have hours go by. Like, you're going to take a shift. Like, it's very much based on uh, being a wage slave, which is a big part of the alien setting. Instead of a detailed combat, instead of detailing the combat system, um, 
in, in general, we're going to give a big overview. And instead of a tactical system with a grid and maps and counting squares, what it does is you do use maps, but it breaks them into large zones. So this is going to be familiar with players who play Fate. A single zone would be, say, one corridor or a single cargo bay or like the bridge of a ship. Larger areas like a hangar bay may be broken into multiple zones. All of the rules for combat, movement, line of sight, range attacks all use these zone rules. Now, while the game can be played theater of the mind, they do expect you and encourage you to use the ship floor plans and tokens. Now, note you're not worrying about where you are by the feet. You're just, you're on the bridge, you're in the corridor, and there's something in the corridor with you. Right. I, I generally prefer theater of the mind. I'm not a big uh, miniature gamer. Uh, I, when you get into games like this, where, you know, that thing around the corner makes a difference, uh, I think it really is important to give everyone that idea of space, even if you're not, you know, going right down to the, to the square or the hex, uh, that idea of space and distance mm-hmm. matters. No, I totally agree. Like, so you're not going to get the, the the map of the cargo hold with every bulkhead and I'm standing behind here. It's just, I'm in the cargo hold. Is there any bulkheads I can get cover behind? Yes, you can. That's that's the level of abstraction. So it's kind of like in between theater of the mind and like a detailed combat system like you'd find in most F20 games. Now, something else unique to Alien that, again, I think fits this theme is an entire section on playing in stealth mode. This is what's used when characters are moving about the ship and unaware of what may be out there lurking in the shadows, or when the sides have swapped and the crew is actually trying to stalk down their prey or set an ambush. Again, I'm not going to get into the details here, but you got full rules for hidden movement system with the GM tracking things behind a screen, using the radar blips on the map and things like that. Well, Space Hulk, anyone? (laughs) Yeah, you you could totally steal stuff between the two, I think. Uh, Another one I want to bring up that's a unique set of rules that's unique to this game that I really liked and I haven't quite seen used this way before is an initiative system. There's a bit of uh, Savage Worlds here because what you're going to use is a deck of cards. Now, these are just initiative cards, one to ten, and you're handed out randomly. So you literally just shuffle them and each player gets a card and then each NPC gets a card or each set of aliens, right? Like the way you normally divvy up and divvy up initiative so you're just randomly going in any order but this is the cool part is that there are a number of actions and things in the game that let you swap cards with other players or adversaries for example at the start of the round before the combat even starts the players can swap cards but only if their characters can communicate with each other so you can actually do the hey you go down the corridor i'll cover you well if you do that you're going to give the lower card to the person going down the corridor and the higher card to the person who's going to stay back and cover them or the other way around so the person that's covering them can set overwatch before the person goes down whatever you can make those kind of strategy and that tactics in addition to that there's other things like if you get a drop get the drop on an enemy you can then swap cards with that enemy so you can take their initiative spot next time when we talked earlier about how you can spend additional successes most of the combat skills you can spend your additional success to swap your initiative and It's just a really brilliant way to kind of do that whole team coordination without like the free form, whoever wants to go goes. Yeah, no, it's a mechanical method of planning out how you're going to approach a problem based off an initial randomization. To be honest, you, you, I read this as, uh, as I was going through the review earlier today, and it's a fantastic idea that I could really see porting to other games uh, especially anything with that militaristic, mm-hmm. um, you know, XCOM type, you know, line yeah. up and line up and take your turn and Overwatch sort of combat system. Yeah, I totally agree. Like I, my favorite initiative system before this was the popcorn initiative, where you just you, one player goes and then they pick who goes next because that lets you kind of set that up. Right. But then eventually someone had to pick the enemy, and that always got kind of weird. And the enemy sometimes would go twice. This this may just replace that for me. Again, I haven't played it, but it just sounds fantastic. Yeah. Now, as for the rest of the combat rules, I'm not going to go into details. It's pretty much what you'd expect. You know, you have close combat attacks and ranged attacks and cover and firing full auto. Um, You have a combination of fast and slow actions. You get one fast and one slow action every turn. Uh, Detailed rules for sneak attacks and ambushes, obviously, because we're talking about Alien here. Uh, On the blog, I go into a lot more detail for anyone who wants to know a bit more about this combat system. So uh, I think any any role players interested in this sort of a game would likely be vaguely familiar, at least with a modern, with modern combat systems. 
So that is it for the core rule book. There's a section on gear in that again, not worth diving into here. So finally, we get to the adventure. This is called Chariot of the Gods. No spoiler here, I don't think. It's a cinematic adventure. So again, it's going to be one of these high stakes, quick, single session, NPC driven game. It's a 48 page adventure meant to be played over one or two sessions. And they claim it's an introduction to the alien system using the contents of the starter set. And again, I am going to try to stick to a very broad overview here because I don't want to spoil anything here. Like there, it, I don't, I don't want to give anything away in case you end up playing this adventure. So you get the five pre-generated characters from the box. These are, of course, designed for this adventure and they're tied to the NPCs and like everything's meshed together here. The maps and agenda cards included in the box are also based on this. So you actually get a deck of cards with the agendas for each character, each act, and you hand them out to the players at the start of the act so they know their personal agenda. And that way they can hide it and not show the other players. And it's not just on their character sheet that's on the table. Brilliant. Like really it is. Now, the adventure starts with an overview and description of the situation. So this is for uh, the Game Master, which in this game is actually called the Game Mother. Um, for anyone who's seen the Alien movies will realize Mother is the name of the AI system that runs all the spaceships, and everyone's always talking to Mother. So it makes sense, the Game Master, the Game Mother in this game, um, gets the, the whole overview. It then goes on to present all the setting information before the actual story, like the actual events. This starts with um, the character ship, so wh where the characters start, and then moves on to a lengthy series of NPCs. Like This is not a small number of NPCs. Yeah, no, uh, I think these NPCs aren't just there for flavor. It's worth paying attention to them, in fact. Yes, because character death is a very real possibility in this scenario, and players are encouraged to take on the role of any NPC already presented if their initial character dies. Uh, this is actually considered a feature of the system. This is part of how cinematic play is meant to play out in Alien. Now, after we get through all the NPCs, you have a surprisingly long section by section, room by room breakdown of the main setting of the adventure. This actually takes up the majority of the module. So, which seems fair since the venue is really what sets up the concepts. You can't have proper space horror if you don't yeah. understand that layout and environment you're within to understand how many different places the alien could be hiding. Yes. So it isn't until page 26 of this book that you actually get to the plot of the adventure. Now, this is done in an event-paced plot, like a, a, almost a timeline in a way. Uh, it's a number of different events split over three acts. Interestingly, some of the events are important to the main plot and are marked as mandatory. So these are the ones that have to happen. But there are a number of additional events there to be used by the game mother if they feel they need to either increase the game length or interject some action or tension when they feel is needed. After the list of events, we get two full rules for two different type of xenomorphs, the details of which I'll leave to your imagination. So a game line, but also the equivalent of a random events table, basically, to help the GM liven things up. Well, now that's a lot of stuff in one box. Mm. So now that we know what you get and some of your thoughts on those components, uh, what was your overall impression on it? All right. So to start, I didn't know what to expect from this. I really didn't. I didn't do any research ahead of time into the system or, or the box set or anything. Uh, basically, didn't know what was in there until I opened it up. And I got to say... The, uh, it was during one of our after shows on the podcast that I opened the box, the shipping box, and I was like, holy cow, I can't believe how heavy this box is. I had just reviewed the Tales of the Loop starter set. I think the same, excuse me, I just reviewed the Tales from the Loop starter set. I think the same podcast episode. So I just held both in my hand. These are from the same publisher. Now, while I thought the Tales from the Loop starter set is a solid starter set, like I have no complaints about it. It's a great introduction to Tales of the Loop. I kind of wanted more from it. It just, it, it felt kind of sparse to me. There just wasn't much in there. This starter set is the exact opposite. This is packed full of stuff. There's a ton of stuff. The quality of what's in there is good to excellent. I love the dice. Like that, those are really nice D6 dice. They're so easy to see and really call out the important numbers that are important to this particular system, which makes them better than standard D6s for that. The map I've already gone on about, it's huge and amazing. The layout and design work is really nice. Uh, despite being over a hundred page book, it's a quick read because they did really good job using negative space. I would say white space, but it's mostly black space. Um, yeah, the character sheets could have been on thicker paper. 
uh, would have been nice to have something a little easier to write on or that I didn't want to ruin. But you know what? You download a blank character sheet and make everyone write out their character stats. Not that big a deal. I did find the tokens a bit odd because I said there's a bunch on there you don't need with this set. But I guess it makes sense instead of making like a new set for every box, you just throw in your standard counter set. I don't know. And with the starter sets used for any cinematic adventure, they may come up later. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Most impressive, though, is the rules. Like, like this is a 100-page book, and this is, like, like not a staple bound. This is, I own RPG rule books that I paid full price for that are considered core books for games that are smaller than this. Like, what I expect when I buy an RPG starter box is a simplified introduction to the game. Like, a set of quick start rules, maybe a sample module. I don't expect to get a fully fleshed out role-playing game rule book. And that's what you get here. Like, I literally have smaller rule books downstairs in this. And it wasn't until reading further that I realized what this box set is. This is everything you need to play cinematic adventures in the Alien universe. I love the idea that they created two entirely different ways to play Alien. Your traditional long play campaign play for people who love to, you know, play level 20 paladins in D&D. And the cinematic fast play single session con style high confrontation game. I love that. And this box set is all you need to play that second part, that that rapid fire in your face, high tension game. Now, what this does mean is I personally don't see any reason I would probably ever pick up the full rule book, which isn't a problem. But I got to say, it's a little odd marketing from Free League that this this set is not meant to sell the bigger box, really. It doesn't it's not the advertising box set that I expect from an RPG starter set. Yeah, it seems they've split their market into two groups, which is fine. But if I wanted campaign play and picked up the starter set first, it could be frustrating. Again, though, those dice and the map, you're not wasting money. No, you got the dice, the map, you got the counter sheet where you've got the only thing missing is there should have been a DM screen, a GM a game mother screen that that would have that would have kicked things up that one extra right. notch. But I really can't complain at this point for what you get in there. What I do wonder is if they're ever considering putting out an upgrade kit, because that's the other reason. If I buy the core book now, at least 100 pages of it, I've already read. How big is it? <laughs> How much am I buying that I already own? Whereas if I could get like the campaign source where maybe they'll put out a starter set for campaign play. I don't know that currently isn't out there now as for the system the 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 dice pool system everything i gotta again i have to admit i haven't i've only read it i've not actually sat down and played it it sounds really solid though now no i have played year zero engine games i have used this dice pool at the table multiple times i played tales from the loop a handful of times and the core mechanic here is the same i know those work i know that core mechanic works and it works well so I, I can't see a problem with the core rules. Now, the big change here is, of course, the whole stress and panic system, which just sounds brilliant. I haven't seen it at the table, but I love the concept of the players having to manage their stress levels and the threat of a cascading panic attack by an entire six crew. Like, that is a great example of tying mechanics to the theme. Yeah, no, I, and stress to a horror RPG is as vital as sanity is to a Cthulhu yeah. one. Uh, and I just did a quick check. 392 pages ah. is the size of the core rule book. So you're still, I don't know what you're, they're There's still that another 300, 300 pages, pages of other stuff. Oh. Well, for one, you'd have to have all the bad guy rules, right? You'd right. have to have all your xenomorphs. That's got to be a significant section because I'll admit the back of that book, the, the, the info in the xenomorphs is not one page per. There's, right. there's some pretty detailed aliens here, <laughs> which if you've seen the series, you can kind of see why they might need Yep, more yep. than one page of rules. Yep. Again, I really don't want to spoil anything no, no, here absolutely. for what types or anything. As for that, ex- the the ex- uh, the adventure, the chariot of the gods. This is a great example of an alien story. Reading that felt like reading a, a script for an alien movie. It's a perfect mix of tension, exploration, interpersonal rivalry, corporate meddling, and horror that I want from a story set in this universe. My only concern, though, is this does not look like an easy-to-run adventure, especially not for a new game mother. Like, there is a lot of front-loading. Like, more than half the book is just giving you, here's the people, here's the places. And you're going to have to learn all that before you even get to, here's what's going to happen there. Um, There's 10 NPCs that you're trying to keep track of, possibly all at once, as well as some PCs. And then there's whatever happens to be lurking around the corners you're keeping track of. That's a lot of stuff. And 
I could see combining that with trying to learn a brand new game, because again, this is supposed to be your first time playing Alien, that could lead to a bit of a mess. This is not one of those Mario adventures. That's why I like to call it where you just slowly introduce the rules so you learn as you play. This is not that. This is not one of those, well, let's make you walk you through a simple check. Okay, let's walk you through a, a hand-to-hand combo. Let's what no, this is not at all. This is a full-blown traditional RPG module with a lot of NPCs, multiple sites to explore, and varied NPC motivations. So that's another aspect of it, is everyone has their own agenda and trying to track those agendas. So what this means is that while this may be a great starter set for the alien RPG, I don't think it should be considered a beginner box in any way. Like besides having a rather complex adventure module, it also has a full rule book for the cinematic mode of play. This is not a beginner box. This is not a quick start rule that you're going to pick up and play the same day you buy it. No way ever is that going to happen. Well, I think it's an awesome box for an experienced group looking to learn a new system. Like for an experienced group that's played lots of RPGs that want to check out Alien, fantastic box here. I don't think it's a good entry point for a new group of role players. Now, I don't know if any new groups of role players are suddenly going to seek out an Alien RPG, but still. Now, is it indicated anywhere on the box? Because I, this is something where, you know, fans of the cinematic series might decide to try to use this as their intro to RPG systems. You know, if, if you're a huge alien fan and you've never been interested in, you know, D&D and, dra you know, dragons mm -hmm. and, and dwarves, this could be something that would that get someone to go all in and say, all right, that does it. We're going to, we're going to start RPG because this looks awesome. Yeah. There, there is nothing to indicate that this is introductory in any way. But it does say this is the starter set for playing cinematic stories in the Alien universe. Right. Like, it doesn't really say either way. It's, right. It says, this is a box set to get you to play cinematic stories in the Alien universe. Right. But it we doesn't should, say this you know, is your starting point. It doesn't say this is the first place to so go. So we're noting, and hopefully, and hopefully people uh, listen to this, that you should not use this as your first RPG. God. That'd be a, it'd be a rough learn, I think. Though I gotta admit, people learned to role play off the AD and D rule books back in the day with the uh, high guy Gaxian. <laughs> so if they could figure that out, I'm sure some people could figure this one out. But yep. I just it I, the thing is, I was I was looking at it and I actually thought the Tales from the Loop one might have been called the beginner box because to me those are two separate products. An RPG beginner box is something for beginners. Yep. Where it's gonna do that hand holding. It's it's the Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion of RPGs. Whereas a starter set to me is how to get started in it. So, but the names, I wish people would take those naming conventions and use them. So for example, the Tales from the Loop starter set was very much a beginner box. Right. Even more of a beginner box was the two Shadowrun box sets we interviewed. Though they may do a variable job on it, but those were very much cut down versions of the rules that simplified everything to try to get you and trying to get you to play right away. Where this is like, like I said, there's no way you're going to break this box out on a Saturday night and start playing Saturday night. It's There's a 100-page rule book to read first, well, 150 once you add the module. It's definitely a bigger step. Right. All right, overall, I got to say I was impressed. that This is a really impressive box set, both in the amount of stuff you get in the box and the quality of what you get. If you've ever considered creating stories in Ridley Scott's Alien Universe, and you are familiar with the basic concepts of role-playing, this is the place to start. This is much more than a beginner box, giving you a full set of rules for playing cinematic, high-tension, high-risk, and high-fatality alien scenarios. It also comes with all the added tools to play, like custom dice and a custom uh, a map and counters and everything you need to do. The included adventure, while not for new GMs, is a perfect example of the kinds of stories you expect and want from an alien base game. And this box set will let you play on its own without the core rulebook any future cinematic modules that are produced. Yeah. For a much more in-depth look at the Alien, the role-playing game starter set, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. Welcome to our spoiler-free review of Exit the Game, The Catacombs of Horror, a exit, uh, big box exit game that's bigger, longer, and harder than any of the other exit games out there. Mm -hmm. Before we get going, I want to take a moment to thank Cosmos for sending us a review copy of this Escape Room in a Box game. 
All right, this is the fourth exit game that we played through. I played through with my with my my wife and some once my one of my daughter and my my mother in law. It's our fourth one. And before we get to this one, I do want to quickly go over our thoughts on the previous exit games we played. So links to the full reviews of each of these games will be in the show notes. All right, so our first exit experience was the Secret Lab. Well, more difficult than we expected, it was just about the right level of challenge. Now, this is rated a 3 out of 5 on Cosmos's difficulty scale. The second game we played was the House of Riddles. Now, after the Secret Lab, we thought trying something slightly easier, because it's a rated 2 out of 5, might be more fun. But as you can read in our review, uh, we found that one a little too easy. Up next, we tried out the Haunted Roller Coaster. Now, this is also rated a 2 out of 5, but this was a newer release, and many people have heralded this as the best gateway to the exit games. And we went in expecting to be disappointed, but we were not at all. We really enjoyed the Haunted Roller Coaster and found it to be one of the most fun escape room in a box experiences we've had. I still think at this time, it is the best gateway to the exit series. Now, after these last two, they were rather easy, a little too easy. We thought it was probably time we checked out something harder. Plus, you know what? It's mid-October and it's the time of year for playing horror-filled games. So this seemed like the perfect time to crack open, exit the game, the catacombs of horror. What better than a spooky horror puzzle for the season? One I should mention the publisher claims people have suggested is itself haunted. Yes, they have. I saw that. So Catacombs of Horror was designed by Inca and Marcus Brand with Ralph Querforth. It features artwork from Sylvia Kristoff, Martin Hoffman, and Michaela Klein. This Escape Room in a Box was published by Fame and Cosmos in 2018. This is the largest, longest, and most difficult exit game they have published so far. What, uh, you won't find an unboxing video for this one as we didn't want to spoil anything for people interested in playing through this puzzle box. So besides coming in a larger, physically bigger box than uh, most of the other, all the other exit games, this has mostly what we've come to expect in all of them. This being our fourth game. There's a short introductory booklet that explains how the game is played and then a bunch of unusual objects like a four-fold poster with a warning on it says, don't open this. Uh, there's a little thin Polaroid-style image. There's a thin card picture in a frame. Three small skulls. These are awesome looking in red, white, and blue. There's a tea light candle, the decoder disc, and a very thin punch board. Now, the punch board contains a number of other strange items. Finally, you have the cards, because all of these exit games are card-driven. There are 28 riddle cards, 48 answer cards, and 42 help cards. Now, the 42 help cards are split into 14 little decks of three cards each. That's the kind of stuff you're going to expect in every exit game with different unusual items each time. What's totally new in this box compared to any of the previous is there's a whole other box in here that's about the size of a normal exit game. This locked box, you don't enter, open until the second half of the game. So two, two, two games in one. Impressive. <laughs> in a way, yeah, pretty much. Now I will note there is a candle. There is a point in this puzzle. You will require a dark room and the candle. And that is required to solve one of the puzzles. Due to the fact you have a live flame at the table, the instruction book has a significant warning section in it. Similarly, the box has one of the most amusing series of warning icons I have ever seen in my life. I hope to show a picture of that during the review. Well, it's sad that we need to overly warn people about what was once the primary form of light for most households. It is better to be safe than sorry, and it's easy enough to get distracted in a game setting and whoop, your game is on fire. Yes. It is worth noting you do not have to burn anything to solve this puzzle. I probably shouldn't, in fact. Yes. There are a total of 14 riddles in the Catacomb of Horrors. Uh, unlike the last two exit games, these are not linearly presented. So in all the, the original, the, the two difficulty ones, it was very much solve this puzzle, turn the page, solve the next puzzle, turn the page. Now I'm saying turn the page theoretically, but move on to the next one. This is the kind of thing where items used to solve one puzzle may be needed to be used in later puzzles. Yeah, and this is more like what I'm used to in the escape rooms, like the, the real physical escape rooms, where what you do in one place will often matter at a later point, which isn't something we've seen a lot in a lot of these no, escape we rooms haven't. and boxes. 
Though again, the Secret Lab did have some of that. So this is definitely hearkening more to that. Now, like all exit games, you are meant to play this immediately out of the box. Uh, unlike our earlier review, there's no preparation required. The rules are written to be read out loud to the players before you start playing the first time. As an alternative to reading the rules, you can also download the Cosmos Helper app, which includes a timer that features ambiance and stuff in the background as well. A nice helper app that helps, but is in no way required. No, not at all. We use it, because why not? Now, after completing the Catacomb of Horrors, you will receive a score based on how quickly you manage to escape, as well as how many clue cards you need to use. Help cards, sorry. How many help cards you need to use. This particular exit game also has some bonus points that can be earned. And you don't actually start the timer at the start of the game. It gets started only after solving a particular clue. Right. Well, interesting, but I won't press for details as no spoilers here. No spoilers here. All right. The story behind Catacombs of Horror. This is on the back of the box. It may sound like a spoiler, but it's not. You receive a letter from your friend Ben, who has gone missing in the catacombs under Paris, where over six million people are buried. It's up to the players to look for Ben and help him escape from this unfortunate situation. Now, the gameplay in this in all exit games, including this one, is based at looking at the clues you have on hand at the start of the game and trying to figure out a code to put into the code wheel. You put that into the code wheel, then you look to an answer card. If you're on the right track, that'll lead you to a further answer card, which will introduce the next puzzle. Only uh, the next puzzle will often have you reveal more clues from the riddle deck and or bring in more of those unusual objects we talked about. This is pretty much the basis for gameplay in all exit games. But now and then they will throw you a curveball and you'll do something else, like some variant of this to unlock the next clue. I will just say that this exit game had some neat ways of moving things forward that weren't just put a puzzle on a on a decoder ring. Well, always good when uh, they can make it uh, make you work for it and not just repeat themselves from earlier games. You don't want to worry that when you buy the next one, you're going to be bored. Yeah, I, this is the the most impressive thing about all these exit games is how did they come up with all these? It blows me away every time we sit down to play one of these. Now, if you ever do get stuck, there are the help cards I mentioned. There are three for each puzzle. The first one is really simple. All it does is make sure you have everything you need to solve the clue on hand, which can be important because, as I said, some clues carry over to later into the game. Second help card gives you a very strong hint. Like, this is pretty close. Like, it's, it's going to tell you how to combine the things you have, probably. Now, the final card does give you the actual solution and the code and the cards you need to look up next. Right, so just enough help when you need it so that you can still have a chance to feel like you accomplished something right up until you flip that third one in frustration and it's over. Then that one's over. Now, one unique feature of the Catacombs of Horror is that it is a longer game experience. It features 14 puzzles, which is actually four more than the original. The original games all have 10. Uh, it's split into two groups of seven and at about the halfway point, you are presented with the option to save your game. This is when you open the contents of the second box and no way I'm telling you what's in there. <laughs> the game at that point indicates that you what you still need, which is really nice. It's like, all right, out of everything you now have all over your table spread everywhere, this is what you still need and this is what you don't. So then you can take the stuff you don't need, throw it out, and you can place what you do need back into the box and return to it at a later date. A handy feature for certain, especially on a longer game like this. Yeah. Uh, the game actually lists as up to four hours at a time and four hours is something a lot of people just don't have to dedicate no. to a game. Very true. Now, in addition to the components that come with the game, you will need a pen or marker of some sort, scissors, and a way to light the candle. Uh, now, again, remember, you won't actually be burning anything. It's very clear about this. You will need somewhere dark to play, and you will end up destroying some of the components in the game, as you do in all exit games. This is important for people who don't know the series because these games are one and done. Once you play it, you're not passing it on to anyone else. You destroy the game as you play. Right. So now that we have a vague idea of what you get in the box and how the system works, how did the Catacombs of Horror play out for you? Well, every time I play one of these games, I am impressed of just the 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 brilliance of of the brands and who they're working with on each game they're just the out of the box thinking that goes into making these 
Like we played four and there are way more than four out there. And so far, every single puzzle has been completely unique. There hasn't been any repetition. And the most amazing part is most of the time you're just looking for three digit codes. I can't believe the number of ways they've thought of to get you to try to find three digit codes and figure out what order those numbers are in. Like I, I just, I, it blows me away every time. And there's always something in every box that completely surprises me. Like something I'm like, wow, I, I would have never, wow. And this is no exception. The sheer number of unusual items, as they call them, and the quality of the items is impressive in this particular game. Like there's a lot of stuff in this box. This is very full compared to just like a single punch board or maybe a marble or something. And I got to say those three tiny skulls are the coolest game components I have seen in a long time. Like I think they beat out the crystal skulls in Zolkin. Like these are awesome. And they make a very cool artifact to keep once the game's done. And I got to say the candle thing is cool. Like they did something neat with the candle. It was well done. Well, it sounds like there might almost be too much stuff in this one. Uh, Keeping track of it must be tough. Yeah, well, this is, that's the problem with this one, right? Because of all the exit games we played, this one was closest to Secret Lab because the problem we have with Secret Lab as our first exit experience is here we have all this stuff and it's in front of you and you have no clue what to do. Like you're, you're literally stumped. Now I played exit games, so I know I'm looking for a three digit code. So I'm trying to find something that'll help me get a three digit code and put it in a code wheel. First time we played Secret Lab, we didn't even know that. So I at least know that. But there's all this stuff. And now I will admit, not all the stuff's on the table at the time. You you only start with a handful of the, the items at the beginning of the game. Uh, but man, like this, it was hard to figure out what to do next. Like this led to us wasting a lot of time, especially because right at the beginning of the game, even you unlock stuff you don't need till the end. And trying to put together things that don't actually go together or putting together the right things, but realizing you're missing a piece or you didn't have something on hand yet led to a lot of wasted time. So really inventory management is vital in these games. Yeah. Keeping track of what goes to what. So what this ended up doing is this had us using way more clues than we have in any previous exit game. Now this is a 4.5 out of five, the highest rating difficulty they have. And there were some brilliant puzzles that took us a while to figure out. And those felt great when you figured them out. Like you're like, oh, it's this, I get it. Or, oh, there's this symbol, so I need to do that. Again, I don't want to spoil anything. But there were a small handful of puzzles in this box out of the 14 that we did not get at all. I have never felt as lost as we did while playing an exit game as we did playing this one. Like we had three adults playing. It wasn't just Deanna and I. We also included her mother. And like, we're all puzzle fans. We played these games before. We're not stupid people. (laughs) And oh, we we could have definitely used one or two more sets of eyes with us or at least other brains thinking another way. Well, that is much like a lot of real escape room experiences. So I guess they really do replicate these rooms in a box. So in the end, the, you get ranked at the end of this game and we only scored three out of 10 stars. And to be honest, it's worse than that because I mentioned earlier, there's a bonus in this one. Technically we got three out of 12 stars because we didn't get the bonus either. Now the box on this game notes a max of 80 minutes per half. We took almost two hours each half. And that's not counting that time before the timer started. By the time we stopped the timer, we are at 220 minutes. And I, I, there had to be a good 20 minutes at least before then. So we're looking at four hours here. Added to that is, is the, the bonus point thing. Like there was this final riddle that I don't know, like, like we failed that, like that, that final riddle completely stumped us and had us actually sit there and look at a third clue card and just have to get the answer. Not because we didn't finish it, but like, how, how did, how would you get to this answer? Cause we can't see how. And there was something there like I, we would have never gotten it without that clue. Well, to be fair, losing is also a part of the escape room experience, if not the best part. No, I agree. Like uh, just overall, as, as you can tell, this was not easy to solve. This is definitely like they're right on the rating. It, this is definitely the hardest escape game they published. This is definitely um, there were puzzles in here that definitely fell on the frustrating side rather than the fun side of things. When we got when we got stumped, uh, what I think we need to do, and what I encourage anyone who plays through this a- exit game and any to be honest, is be more liberal with the use of the help cards. 
your overall score is actually affected more by the time you take than the number of cards. So if you're worried about your score, you're actually better off using like getting the clues earlier. Plus, it's important to note that when you get a clue card, if it doesn't teach you anything new, if it doesn't actually help you, it doesn't count against your score. So grabbing that top card just to confirm you have everything you need on hand could just be that little extra push to realize, oh, I only need these three things. And it didn't teach me anything new. So that's not even counting against you. So it's just to, to make sure you're on the right track and get you past that roadblock. Right. This is actually something we ran into in, in real rooms too. Uh, sometimes things just don't work and you need a hand from you call, calling the referee to point out yeah. that you were doing it right, but you hadn't pressed hard enough or there was just something that, yes, you were doing everything right, except you, this happened. Yeah. While the puzzles were, were mostly solid, I, the one thing I did find is they weren't neat. Like they weren't as whimsical and fun as they were, at least in the last exit game, we played the haunted roller coaster. Like these felt more like the puzzles in secret lab. And I wonder if that's again, because this is one of the older games. This wasn't published. This is a 2018 game, whereas a haunted roller coaster is a 2019. And I think they've gotten better as the time's gone on and they've gotten to make them more fun instead of more logic and spotting the right thing. Um, also the theme, I actually like the theme better in haunted roller coaster that felt more fun in Halloween with ghost skeletons and Frankenstein's monster where this was ritualistic horror. Um, and very much like hurry rush time, um, which also led to catacombs of horror, not being family friendly. Uh, so actually we're glad we didn't include the kids on this one. Like we had a pretty good idea by the cover of the box and everything and the tone of it, but this one definitely is not as family friendly as say catacombs of horror, which is about being on a haunted roller coaster and running into silly ghosts and stuff. Haunted roller coaster is about, yes. Not, not catacombs. catacombs of horror. Now, as soon as you mentioned the catacombs beneath Paris, I pretty much ruled out the kids there right yeah. away. <laughs> Overall, I have mixed thoughts. I don't know. Um, like I remember while playing it, feeling very frustrated a number of times and honestly feeling stupid sitting around. What, what's wrong with us? Like, why can't we figure this out now? Looking back on the experience after the fact, I don't know. Those times don't seem as bad. And I clearly remember the rewarding moments, the, oh, we solved that right away. And we figured that, oh, remember when I got these two things to work together, when I took that and put it with this, oh, that was brilliant. So I don't know, it, it, it's it, it's leaving me with, with, with mixed feelings. Catacombs of Horror is definitely quite difficult. I would be extremely impressed to learn that anyone got 12 stars in this, like, I, I, maybe it's out there, but like you got to be an idiot savant or something to be able to pull this off. Cause like, I don't see it. We got three, like, and I'm looking at it. I'm like, even if we pulled more clues, well, if we pulled more clues, you wouldn't get 12 either. Like, I just can't see it. It, it seems to be that step above. Well, and that's the big upside on this. Not feel, not you're feeling in the moment, the stress and the frustration, but afterwards when you laugh and joke about it, win or lose, uh, that's really kind of the, the experience of the game, right? right? It's that, it's that after it's what you walk away with, not, you know, cursing and, and swearing in yeah. the, in the moment because you didn't do as well as you wanted to, or you got completely stumped on something mm. for some reason. Yeah. And we definitely even had that because we did take two days to play it that after playing the first day, I was more looking forward to go back the second day, even though we had been frustrated a number of times the first day. I, overall, I definitely don't recommend Catacomb of Horrors for anyone who hasn't played an exit game before. There is no way this should be considered a gateway. If you're looking for a gateway exit game, pick up Haunted Roller Coaster. Save this one until you have more experience. And I would suggest more experience than just Haunted Roller Coaster. I would recommend Haunted Roller Coaster than maybe Secret Lab or something else that's a rated three. I would also point people towards Haunted Roller Coaster if you're looking for a spooky game to play on Halloween. Uh, just to tie in with the podcast episode where we're recording this, we we're talking about great games to play with your family on Halloween. That's going to be Haunted Roller Coaster, not Catacomb of Horror. If you find most escape room games in a box too easy, or if you're an expert at doing escape rooms, or if you really like to be challenged, this may be the box for you. Catacombs of Horror has some great components that are used and some really cool ways to do things and solve things and contains a broad range of puzzles that are going to challenge any group. It's just up to you if you really think you're up for that challenge and it's something you'd enjoy. Well, for a more in-depth look at Exit the Game 
Chronicles of, no, not Chronicles of Horror, Catacombs of Horror, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on reviews. Where did I go? And now the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last year. What games hit our tables? We really got to throw in the the lobbies, I think, for the reviews. I keep forgetting about that. Evil John had some stuff to say about aliens that we missed. Um, I don't know. I saw some come and watch it at my house. I didn't see that, but he said, oh, man, again, that game sounds good. And then Deanna was talking about laminating the character sheets, which I think is a brilliant idea. John's noting he'd laminate anything. So Deanna's got a bunch more notes about the last one for anyone here live. Uh, well, I guess on the full podcast, you'll hear this as well. So um, Deanna notes that a dark room is required. Think about this when you start, because yeah, playing in a bright sunlit dining room wasn't the best choice. We did have, I have a bit of an issue with that puzzle. Um, I'm not sure what Deanna noted. I like that part. It was thematic. Um, yeah, her and her mom fought over who got to keep the skulls. That's the only disappointment I had for playing it there instead of here. <laughs> there was one puzzle I don't think we ever in a week of Sundays would have figured out. I agree. There was one. But then there was another that we were completely stumped. And when Holly walked in the room, she's like, can I see that? And immediately said she would have got it. Now, I don't know. If she was there at the table. If she would have got it. But she happened. She wasn't actually playing. She just came in and out of the room and was like, oh, obviously it meant to do this. And like, we would have never got that um the final one like the the final one um was after reading the clue card we still couldn't figure it out it took us five to ten minutes to figure out what the clue card was telling us to look for so like that that one was just like oh come on um there was a particular puzzle i don't even want to mention the the word she's talking about there where we spent 25 minutes physically manipulating things so that is something that has come up in our previous review of exit games that people do not like. Is you're on a timer and you have to cut stuff out. Why am I being penalized for my cutting skills? Right. And this does have cutting, folding, destroying, drawing, and all of that. And it's kind of frustrating because in this particular puzzle, we figured out what to do instantly. It was the physical act of doing it. We found difficult and wasted 25 minutes on one puzzle out of 14. Mm, that is tough. time so that that was a although although one. to be fair i mean the, the the last escape room i did had a balance beam you had to cross in yeah, order so. to you know in order to do so there there are aspects of that uh yeah. in in other uh you know in other games and, and there's there's timing things uh you know i've had to you know have four people on opposite sides of a pillar each doing different actions in time oh geez so it's so yeah it's definitely an aspect of the games um i'm trying to there was uh, one of the things was not starting the time until a story point that was actually really cool because that because at that point there was no concern and then all of a sudden something happened and there was a concern where time would matter and right. how it did that was a nice Makes touch that yeah. hasn't been in the previous ones um there was something else i saw oh and, the, and she's noting that the the first clue was much more helpful here because in the other games all the, the puzzles were self-contained so generally you had everything you needed Whereas this one, there were definitely some times, and we counted these against us because we were like, we were sitting there trying to figure this thing out, and we're like, man, this makes no sense. And it ends up we were putting two different puzzles together. Like we were putting the components from two different puzzles and trying to make them work together. Right. And I think you were, you know, you mentioned uh, uh, having having Dee's sister come in uh, and solve sometimes, and sometimes it really is that uh, matter of a fresh view. Right. Yeah. It can help to have people not working on something and busy with something mm -hmm. else so that if you need a, a help or a fresh set of eyes, they can come over and look at your puzzle and go, oh, well, that's this, this, even though you've been beating yeah. your head around on a different direction for five minutes. Oh, exactly. And that's actually why we went to these moms, because these mom is as great at puzzles and we played the previous exam room for though for her she was a bit overwhelmed like i i, I kind of wish we had introduced her to an easier exit <laughs> game first because here are d and i just like throwing cards around because we played exit games because the basic system's all the same I, and and this one what's surprising is i actually disagree with uh board game geek here because board game geek actually says recommended at two and this one in particular i think you need those extra eyes that extra way of thinking now, again, there is the disadvantage of you are generally only solving one puzzle at a time, and there's usually a physicality to it, and only one person can do that physical thing. 
So you do have three other players just kind of staring and watching if you're playing with four, but it's that interaction and talking and working way through puzzles that I think is really useful. So I actually, in this case, I very seldom disagree with board game geeks recommended player count. And this one I do, I think you want at least three, if not four, just to have that out of the box thinking where you need to spot. There was a lot more attention to detail required in this than previous exit games we played. Things were not obvious and it would have been nice to have that right extra person there it's interesting that the i don't i don't grasp how um bgg actually works out their recommended numbers very well it's the numbers are odd um while two has a strong best um one and four actually have incredibly strong recommended um and the only thing that's not recommended is more than four so yeah again like there's not enough stuff to pass around but for yeah. four people you can be working on one part of a puzzle while someone else is working on things i can be looking at this while you cut like there's definitely a lot of that and with one you're just gonna get killed by the physicality because instead of i'm cutting this while you're putting things together it's i'm cutting this now i'm putting it together right i i, I can't see doing it unless again you you apply to mensa and <laughs> you know win some awards if you can figure this one out solo right Overall, I, it was fun in retrospect. Like like they said, it wasn't as much fun at the time. I did notice that this is, again, one of the older games. This did come out before Haunted Roller Coaster. And now I kind of wish they'd do another big box to see if, like Haunted Roller Coaster, it seems like they've improved it a bit more. Right. So we didn't really do this part, but basically looking at other games we played this week, we uh, had another spooky game, which is Nyctophobia. Now, I talked about Nyctophobia early in the show where you're talking about our horror game recommendations, but I want to talk specifically about the Vampire Encounter version. That's the one I have. Um, the basic premise in this one is a vampire is hunting some kids in the wood who are trying to find a lost friend. So they have to go out into the woods, find their friend, and get the friend back to the car before being eaten by the vampire. What's really brilliant in these games is, is the fact that everyone playing the kids are blind. And that, that is so neat. And hearing about Nyctophobia, it sounded cool. But like you have no clue till you actually sit down and do this, how brilliant it is. We played a four-player game. I played the vampire. Deanna, Holly, and Brenda were the kids. And we had a way better time than we expected. Uh, Holly, in particular, seemed to really like it and is looking forward to more plays. She's like, well, we have to play that again. When can we play play, play Nyctophobia again? Like we had, it, it was just such a neat game. And like this, the way you play, um, I'll probably do a full review. So I don't want to get into all the details, but just the mechanics of when it's your turn, you hold out your hand and then the vampire puts your finger on your playing piece. And then you start your turn by having to feel to your Northeast, South and West to see what's around you. And then you have to move. But then after you move, you can search, but you don't have to. If you search and touch the vampire, he catches you. So there's a reason you may not want to touch. And the trepidation of do I touch or don't I? And, and like the accidental bumping of things. Oh, I touched something. Is that is that the vampire? Was that a wall? Like, oh, that whole aspect of it was fascinating. And when the note, uh, Holly is in the chat room. As well. Our friend's name was Steve. He came. Um, our, our group of heroes did manage to win. Uh, I didn't even sugarcoat it. That is one of the things I've seen in reviews of this game is that it can be a little too easy for the hunter and that the hunter should probably play GM and make it a more fun experience instead of just playing to win. But I played to win and I didn't do that well. Now I admit I hadn't read all the cards ahead of time and probably didn't play them the best way. But man, what a neat concept for a game. Yeah, no, it's the, the it's just a fantastic idea and, and the story of the development and everything about this game just just sort of is almost inspiring even yeah like it's just the concept behind it right like i want to be able to put people on a level playing field with my blind uncle like even yeah. that concept is just so cool this is the game if we ever meet up with red meeple ryan in real life we gotta we're gonna have to hook up with him and we're gonna have to play play the mind meeple and he'll have to get a helper so he can play the vampire just so he can <laughs> get the experience 
Now, up next is uh, on our play to, in our week in review is a game that I thought might have been horror, but it ends up it wasn't. So I recently received a review copy of Chronicles of Crime 1400. This isn't released yet. This is the latest Chronicles of Crime game from Lucky Duck Games. This is the first in a new series called the Millennium Series, where they're going to do different time periods. Um, note, this is standalone. You don't need to know, play. You don't have to have Chronicle of Crime. This is this is its own standalone game. Uh, it was successfully kickstarted. I noticed when I shared pictures, a bunch of people on Kickstarter like, "Oh, I want my copy," and I'm like, "Please don't get mad. I got one. It's a review copy. It's not like local stores got it before you got yours." Uh, this is a app-driven mystery game. This particular one being set in Paris in the year 1400. Now, when you say app-driven, this is really app-heavy. Yeah. Unlike just using a helper app, correct? Yeah, this is almost like an app game with board game components. Uh, in the same way that, say, World of Yoho right. is is very much you must have the app. This is an app-driven game that has some card components to facilitate using the app in a way. They, they're, they're definitely well integrated. So what this game is includes, actually, it doesn't even yet, because they're not even all, all, all the scenarios aren't even published yet. Like I said, this one isn't out, is there is a tutorial and four uh, crimes to be solved. We just played through the tutorial. Now, this is my first experience with Chronicles of Crime. There is a full series of game and a number of expansions, and it's a it's a modern uh, UK setting. So you're playing like the, the Bobbies, the British police in the original game. This is um, really interesting system. So in this particular one, you are playing a prescient investigator. So I don't know where you get your special powers from, but every crime starts with you having a vision. This vision is going to let you see either the recent past or the recent or soon to come future. You're then hired by someone and presented with a case and the first clues and you're going to work out from there. Now, I don't want to get into full details because it's my first time playing. We've only done the tutorial. We'll be doing a full review eventually. But this game basically has you moving to different locations in Paris, interviewing suspects and investigating items. Now, all of these are represented by cards with QR codes on them. So a location will have a QR code on it. Uh, a suspect or the person who hired you will have a QR code on it. A suspect you hear about will have a QR code. If you're looking for, well, here we can, I don't see how you're going to really spoil anything in the tutorial. The first thing has you looking for uh, a missing ring. So you get a card for the ring that you don't have. So it goes in the spot of the board, which represents things you know about, but you don't have in your possession. So you put it in the, the blue spot of the board, and then the person that hires you can then interview them about it. As new clues are found, you're going to put them onto the board. Now, in this particular series, you also have a loyal dog with you, a pup with you, who's really good at sniffing things and tracking things down. Now, no, I couldn't sniff the ring that I know about because I don't have it, right? So that's one of the distinctions in the game. And then you also have your home that has three family members, your brother, your sister, and someone else. I think it's an uncle. And these are people you can ask for help, and they're experts in different things. So one of them is a monk, so he's expert in everything religious. There's someone else who's a traitor, so they know the noble houses in the city and stuff like that. So eventually what you do is you're going to go around the board, talk to people and scan their card. And when you scan their card, they're going to say like, hi, how's it going? And then you scan what you want to ask them about. So you can then scan a location or a different person or an item. And then you just kind of combine that. And then you ask the different people about the different things. And as new clothes are found, you put them on the board. And then you have new people to talk to, to move to different locations. You scan them and you keep doing this until you've solved the mystery. And that's up to you to decide when you're ready. Like, you're like, all right, I think I've got it solved. When you do that, you go back home and you click on the end scenario. At that point, the game's going to ask you a series of questions. And based on how those, you answer those questions, you're going to get a score. And then it's going to point out anything you missed. If you got a perfect score, you got everything. But it's going to be like, oh, you did fairly well, but you missed the fact that this person was having an affair. Or you missed the why. Or you didn't find the thing. It's a really unique system. Yeah, now... Does this app require a data connection as well, or is everything contained once you download the app? So to get the app, you obviously need to be online. You then can download each scenario. Once they're downloaded, you no longer have to be online. Okay, well, that's good. So you can bring it out somewhere and, yep. you know, hey, we're going to the game store. We're going to play these scenarios. Let's download yeah. this and have it ready. But no, you have to get that specific scenario. So you can't just have Chronicles of Crime 1400 downloaded. You have to have Chronicles of Crime 1400 Scenario 3 downloaded. Right. But you could pre-download all of them if you wanted to. I don't know how much space they take up, though. That may or may not be a problem for people. Right. Okay. But it's good to know the, the options there. Yeah, the option is definitely there. 
Now, there's another aspect of this game that's worth noting, and that is the ability to search a location. Now, you won't be able to search every location you go to, but some of them, generally a crime scene, you'll be able to search it. And this is done in VR using your mobile device. And this can even be done in 3D if you have those like special glasses you put on your phone to see things in 3D, which suppose we are sold separately. They didn't come in the game. Uh, you get 40 seconds to look around the area, physically looking around the area to try to spot things. While you're looking, you're going to show things to the other. Like all oh, a bed, and under the bed I see a blue dress, and at the foot of the bed there looks to be some kind of footlocker, and oh, there's a painting on the wall, and there's some windows, and you're just gonna basically tell everyone what you see. While you're doing that, the other players have this deck of item cards, and they're gonna look through it and pull out the item cards. Now these aren't specific, so like for example, you might see a crossbow. Well, the card you're gonna pull out is ranged weapon. Or you might see paintings on the wall of a woman and all it says in, in the cards, you might pull out art object and painting. Or you might see a dress and you might pull out cloth and clothing. And that's it. So they're not like you need the blue dress card. It's just they're, they're much vaguer. For example, in the adventure I talked about where you have a missing ring, instead of saying ring, it actually said jewelry. So in a later adventure, that could be a necklace or it could be a, a choker or something else. Right. After you're done searching, you only get 40 seconds to do this. You're then going to scan all the items and it'll tell you if those are actually clues. So it might be like, oh, you looked out the window, there's nothing important to see. Or it might be, wow, this perfume bottle smells of a specific type of elderberries. Put this on your item sheet. So now you now have this perfume that you can now go ask people about. You do also get the option to have another player search, but this takes time in the game. Must be your mother's perfume. Um yeah. <laughs> So I, I love the idea that you can run that with uh, Google Cardboard. Uh, that yes. that's one thing I, I hadn't I hadn't seen you mention. Uh, and so yeah, the idea that you're actually throwing on your Google Cardboard and yep. looking around the room uh, really makes that way more interactive oh, yeah. than I would have suspected. And it's nice that because you've got the Google Glass on, you can be still interacting with the other people who are helping you, you know, sort out the cards you need. Yep. It's not just one person staring at their phone. Yeah, I, honestly, I don't know if you could play this one person because you'd have to look around and then remember what you found. I didn't look on the box to see what it says for number of players, but I would assume at least two just for that. Overall, this is a fascinating system. Just really well done. Now, we've only done the tutorial. Uh, I got to say it was surprisingly deep. Like, it took a while. Like, uh, th th we had to set it up and sort some cards and stuff. But, like, I'm thinking we'd spend, like, 45 minutes to an hour just on the tutorial. So I am, I, I think a full crime might take a while, like two hours. Now, Deanna did have one complaint, which I didn't didn't click in while we were playing, but I think it is important. And that's the fact that there's a serious disconnect. Like here, you're supposed to be in 1400 Paris, but then you're using an app to scan a bunch of QR codes. Like this is pretty much the opposite of tying the theme to the mechanics in this case. Well, I suspect they couldn't fit the zoetrope and all the inserts for it inside yes. the box. Uh, and just, just a note, uh, BGG does have it listed as one to four players. One, I wonder how you do one. Like a good know. memory, I guess. I guess a good memory. All right, so that's it for Chronicles of Grime 1400 for now. More to come in the future as we try the actual scenarios. Now, the last game I want to talk about this week has nothing to do with the theme whatsoever tonight, and that is Robotech Force of Arms. Though earlier in our chat room, they did point out that it's all about an alien invasion. So there's your horror angle, is aliens are invading Earth and trying to steal our protoculture. So there, there's our theme. Uh, this is the first of three Robotech board games that have been put out by a company called Solar Flare Studios. Uh, ever since Palladium has lost the license, it's kind of spread out into the universe, and various companies have bought up licenses and have been putting out games this is an abstract strategy game that i swear I, maybe they ripped them off or what but this is a rainer nitzia game like this is a math the game style of game like i have rainer nitzia's kingdoms has so much in common with this game well not just being a direct read theme but i'm like i would not have been shocked if someone had to explain that rainer nitzia made this game this is a two-player card game. One player is playing the Robotech Defense Force. The other player is playing the Zantradi Fleet. The game recreates one epic space battle from the series. Not a specific one, just generic. Here's a big space battle going on. You're going to build a three-by-three three grid of eight ships, four for each side, and one area of empty space. This is randomized every game. Players are going to get a hand of 12 fighters. Each turn, players are going to get the option to move one of their ships, and what they do is they just swap it for another spot. And then play two of their fighters. These are placed at the end of a row or column on the grid. 
after all the fight, the play just goes back and forth doing this until everyone's fighters have been played. Then players get a chance to play one of their hero cards. I think each race has four. I can't remember off the top of my head, but they're the, they're the named characters from the series. It's who you'd expect. You know, you got Roy Falker and Rick, Rick, and you on the other side, you got Bree Ty and whatever. You're going to play one of those and they're going to mess with things, right? In some way. And then you're each going to play two tactic cards. Again, this is going to mess with things in some way, let you move things, change things around, swap ships, and so on. Once this is all done, you're then going to flip up all of the fighters. Added to this, there's some weird rules for tokens that give bonuses and stuff, but we're not going to worry about that here. Then you're going to do bath. You're going to look at the first ship in the top left corner. You're going to add up, look at what side it is. So say it's the Robotech side. You're going to add up all of the Zentradi attacks on all of the Zentradi ships on the, the cross, right? So your columns and your rows. And then you're going to compare that to all the defense that the RDF put there. If the attack beats the defense, the attacker takes the card. If the defense is higher, the defender keeps the card. You do this for all the eight ships. Then you add up the victory points for the ships. Whoever has the most points wins. That's pretty much it. So simple enough, but very abstract. Yeah, this is definitely an abstract game. Like this is a, a neat math-based abstract. I dig the theme. It's Robotech. I definitely not tied to the theme. So you do get a bit of a feel of a bunch of fighters zooming around big capital ships and the fact that some fighters are attacking, defending, but that's about as close as it gets. The system works surprisingly well. Uh, it's pretty easy to learn and teach, though the, make sure you cover the iconography a couple times. What I recommend doing is just play a quick round once just to see it and then play a second round for real. Uh, there's an interesting mix here of symmetry and asymmetry because the symmetry is the decks of fighters are actually identical. Your 12 cards are the same as the opponent's 12 cards with different names. But then the heroes are all completely different. And the command decks, one of the four cards is the same is different from the other, but the other three are the same. So it's one of those games where you can really learn the opponent's decks and what's out there. So it's almost perfect information. Now you're not going to know what they played face up or face down, but you know that if they played their three ship, their three defense ship, they don't have another three defense ship. And then you've got that perfect information going on. I also really like the fact that this takes up a small footprint. Like you're looking at five by five grid max of playing card size cards. This is another one of those games that's going to be good for playing at a hotel or at a bar. In particular, I want to play this at the small table that's in the room at Jack's because it's the right perfect size for this <laughs> kind of game. I, I like small portfolio games. I was impressed. I, I didn't know what to expect from this. I wasn't expecting much, and this was a better game than I expected. I don't know if it really made me feel like I was playing Robotech, but it's a solid, quick, mathy filler. Excellent. Well, how about a uh, look ahead? All right, so next week's our AMA. Uh, I got to admit, that's as far as I've gone, as far as planning things out with Prime Day and everything else that was going on. I know we were talking about trying to, to pre-schedule stuff, so maybe that's something we're going to have to do over the next couple of days is pre-schedule out a few things. Um, we've already got a bunch of unboxing videos recorded this past week, so we're good for those. Uh, people will be able to watch for those coming out on Mondays on YouTube. Um, this also means with all a bunch of stuff open, I got a ton of new stuff to play, so... On the top of the list is The Shining. Uh, that's the latest Coded Chronicles game. Uh, I don't know. Maybe we'll review that next week. We'll see as part of our AMA because then we're going to get it out just after Halloween. I wasn't worried about getting it out before Halloween because you can't buy it, right? right. So yeah, yeah. Why, why get people excited for it? But <laughs> I kind of want to get the review out before it's out there so people can yeah, read no. our review before they purchase it. They know that if they want to buy. So yeah. that might be one. And I really want to play some more Chronicles of Prime 1400. So that, that those might be our two games for next week. We'll see. I am looking forward to trying out a true crime, uh, a full crime. And while more Robotech would be kind of cool. And I know Holly wants to play some more Nyctophobia and see if she can save Steve again. <laughs> I want to play. I want to see the other side. That's why the main reason I can't review that game yet is I haven't been blind yet. I got to be blind at least once before I can review that one. Um, I'm sure Ryan may not agree with you on that one, but hey. <laughs> well, I want to be blind for the, the, the game, that game, and that is it. All right. Now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Yuho Rutila, thank you. Jeff Seuss, hope the Alien games have been going well. Kator, miss you, folk. Timothy Smith, thanks, Timothy. And thank you, William Fisher. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though so the doors to the lobby are closed and the portcullis is slammed shut. 
You can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. And if you do dig the content we've been putting out, it would be awesome if you consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. New York, Toronto time and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And And game game on. on.